Oh, I'm loving it. Love that you guys are here. Want to welcome you here to North Point Church. Uh, just so excited. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to take much time here by way of introduction because I know that we all just want to dig in. Uh, but uh, I do, uh, I am just so excited that uh, Steve Gregg is here. Brother, we just love having you. I will say that when we were on stage together today, if you were in church, it was the first time that somebody told me, they know I love Lord of the Rings, and they said for the first time it looks like Gandalf standing with Frodo. <laughs> and I, I just got to say... <laughs> I'm all right with that. And then later, you know, uh, we were doing part of our new YouTube channel that we're putting together, Pathfinder. We did a Q&A that you will hear about and see later uh, in coming weeks. But he said later that if he's Gandalf, he's Gandalf the White. That's what he said. And, and I got to say, I'm okay with being Frodo because you know it's the hobbits that saved the world. So we're okay with that. But uh, guys, I'm not going to steal his thunder. We'll have more announcements at the break, but would you give a North Point welcome to Steve Gregg as he comes? Well, it's exciting to see everyone here, and I know that some of you, many, maybe most of you, are regular attenders at this church, and others of you might not be. You might be people who listen to my radio broadcast and heard about it that way, but uh, I've talked to so many wonderful people here. I, I'm really ex- kind of excited about this church. I didn't even know about this church until I came here, and uh, it sounds like really good things are going on, and I I have really had great um, fellowship with the leaders and and with others that I've met here. As you know, we're talking about the four views of Revelation, and it was back in the, back in 1983 that I thought about uh, writing such a book. Actually, I, I, I didn't think about writing it. I was looking for a book like that. I was sure someone else had certainly written one, and I certainly did not want to write one, but um, I, because I was running a Bible school, I had to teach through the whole Bible verse by verse every year, and that included Revelation. Uh, I had been taught all my life a certain way of looking at Revelation, but I had also read books because I'm quite uh, a reader, I had been exposed to some other views of Revelation that were radically different than what I had heard. And initially that shocked me and and concerned me. Uh, But as I read books, I discovered there had been four views, including the one that I was raised believing, and there's like three others, that had been held for centuries by Christians uh, and not by heretics. They were they're very different from each other, but by you know, mainstream Christian scholars uh, had held four very different views. Now, and, I, and I found them in different books, but what, since I was teaching through Revelation once year, I wanted to find a single book that had them all. Not just one that told me what they were, but I wanted to see a, a verse-by-verse commentary through the whole book of Revelation with four columns that had in one column the commentary of that particular section from one view, another column, the same uh, section described from the other view, and so forth. And I, uh, I truly did not want to write the book, and I looked for it for about 10 years, and I discovered it's never been done. Uh, I, I actually had access to over 100 commentaries on Revelation at a, a Christian uh, college near me. That I, I went to their library. And I looked at them all, and there wasn't anyone who had done this. I thought, I'm, I can't be the only person who wants a book like that. And, I, uh, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll write it. And so I shopped it out, and, and Thomas Nelson Publishers was interested in it. And so I wrote a book called Revelation Four Views, a parallel commentary. And it's just like what I just described. It goes through the book of Revelation passage by passage, and it has four columns on the page, on a two-page spread. And you've got the, the commentary on that passage from one view, and then uh, next to it, this commentary on the same passage from the other. I read 50 commentaries in writing the book. It took me several years, and I, I actually wrote four commentaries uh, because I would read only like a dozen commentaries on one view, and then I'd su- go through the whole book of Revelation, summarize it in the first column. Then I'd read a dozen or more commentaries on the next view, and I would try to convince myself of each view at the time so that I could write it as sympathetically as possible. And usually when you hear uh, someone present different views, they, they, they favor their own views so much that they end up being a little sarcastic, make little jabs at, at other views and stuff like that. I just wanted to, be, I wanted to be convinced of the view I was writing so that I could write it as well 
as if it was my own view. And, and I wasn't sure if I succeeded, but the book's been out since 1997. And uh, if I read the, uh, you know, the Amazon reviews and stuff properly, it looks like most people say that I have succeeded. Most readers cannot tell what my view is even after they've read the book. And that's exactly what I aimed at that it's not indoctrinating, it's not advocating any one view, it is an attempt to educate the body of Christ that there's more than one. And why would I want to do that? I mean, uh, why bother writing a book about Revelation if you're not trying to promote your own view of it? The reason is because, well, it's like there's a, a statement attributed to Mark Twain. Uh, there's some question whether he actually made this statement, but it's a great one. Uh, it sounds like him, and you probably have heard it. He said, it ain't the things you don't know that are going to give you trouble. It's the things you know for sure that just ain't so. And I think that's where I found myself in my early years of ministry and also I find most people to be. They know for sure which view of Revelation is true, but it just might not be so. But I don't blame them because they've never heard any other view. When I told my friends I was writing a book years ago on the four views of Revelation, they said, well, they said, most of them said, I, th I think I know th three views. I don't know what the fourth one would be. Like there's pre-trib and there's mid-trib and there's post-trib, right? I said, no, those are all part of one view. The other three views are not even included in that. And they said, well, you must mean uh, premillennialism and amillennialism and postmillennialism. Those are the three views. No, those, aren't, those are only views of one chapter in Revelation. Revelation 20 is the only chapter in Revelation that talks about the millennium, and therefore, those are not views of the book of Revelation. Those are books of the millennium, I mean, views on the millennium. But, you know, people are usually shocked when they hear what the four views are. But I'd just like you to know that if the view you're familiar with is the one that almost everyone is today, it's the most recent view to emerge in church history. All four views have been around for hundreds of years, but the, the one that we're most familiar with emerged only about 200 years ago, and the others were around longer. And there was a very different view that almost no one holds today. That was the unanimous Protestant view of the book of Revelation for 300 years. And I like to you know, let people know that if you had been born 200 years ago in America or Europe, somewhere in the West, you would have never heard of a view of Revelation that said it's about the end times. Well, what else could it be about if it's not about the end times? Well, I'm not saying it isn't. I'm saying that that view would, was unknown 200 years and more ago. It's a fairly recent development. Now, it may, when I learned that, I thought, well, I mean, God may have saved, uh, you know, saved the revelation of the meaning of the book until the end times, and then he let people know. Uh, and that, that's not an impossible uh, prospect. But I was just so surprised because I thought, well, what else could they have believed than that? And that's what we're going to find out. What else was there to believe? Now, before we look at the four views, we have to know something about the book of Revelation that many Christians simply have never been told or don't understand or don't know. And that is that the book of Revelation is probably not like any other book you've ever read. And it's actually, um, which way am I supposed to aim this thing? It's supposed to be over there. Okay, I'm clicking, but it's not moving. Anyway, the book of Revelation is not like any other book in the uh, New Testament at all. In fact, in, it's not really that much of a, it's not really that much like any other book in the Bible. You might think of the book of Daniel and a few other Old Testament prophetic books as being like Revelation, and in many respects they are, but Revelation is, is unique. For one thing, it's paradoxical. Now, what's that mean? Well, it means it's got opposite traits uh, within it. For example, uh, it's the most difficult book of the Bible. Now, I want to just say this. I have heard a certain set of Bible teachers of a certain denomination, which I have been affiliated with in the past, who they say, why do people say Revelation's a hard book? It's simple. It's easy. You just take it literally. Well, I would say even taking it literally is not, doesn't make it a simple book, but you can't take it all literally. It's got too many things that are clearly not literal. 
For example, when we hear about the beast and the mark of the beast, you know that from chapter 13 of Revelation? The beast is described as an animal having the mouth of a lion, feet of a bear, body of a leopard, and it has seven heads and ten horns, and it's going to rule the world. Now, does anyone believe a literal animal fitting that description is going to rule the world? Of course not. And it'd be ridiculous to think that, because anyone familiar with the Bible knows that Daniel also saw a bunch of beasts. In fact, he saw a lion and a bear and a leopard and a ten-horned beast in Daniel chapter 7. They all came out of the sea. And we know from our studies of Daniel that those were empires. The Roman Empire was the last of them, and that's the one that was, uh, you know, the one that Jesus came during. But there was the Babylonian, the Media Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman Empire. So in Daniel, we see these beasts represent empires, and nobody doubts that. Now, when you come to Revelation, you get elements of all four of Daniel's beasts mixed together. Instead of a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a beast with ten horns, you get a mouth of a lion, feet of a bear, a body like a leopard, and you've got the ten horns, but they also add the seven heads. You've got, is that literal? Does anyone take that literal? No, but they don't know that they don't. Everyone knows it's not literal, but they think they're taking it literally. And then when you take something symbolically that they think you should take literally, they say, oh, you're supposed to take this all uh, literally, really. Do you know that in Revelation 5, 6, Jesus is described as a lamb. And he is called a lamb about 27 times in the book of Revelation, the most common designation. The lamb did this, the lamb did that. This is the wrath of the lamb. Is Jesus actually a lamb? We're so familiar with the phrase, the lamb of God, as applied to Jesus, that we don't realize he's not literally a lamb. In Revelation 5, 6, the first description of him is he's a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. Now, the number seven is very symbolic in the Bible, but let's, you, when you see Jesus, do you expect to see a lamb with seven eyes on his face and seven horns on his head? In the Bible, he always looked like a human. And even later in Revelation, when he's riding the white horse with the sword out of his mouth, and sword, he looks like a man there too. The, the lamb image is a symbol image. In fact, maybe even riding a white horse could be symbolic. It says in Acts chapter 1 that Jesus is going to come back in like manner as he went away. He didn't go away on a horse. And he didn't have a sword sticking out of his mouth. And, and the fact that the sword was coming out of his mouth, and it's a sharp two-edged sword, strongly suggests it's a symbol of his word. The word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, it says in Hebrews 4.12. So, you know, it's, these things are symbolic visions. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't correspond to real life tangible things. They do. But the question is, how do we know what things they are unless we recognize we're reading a symbolic book? That's why it's the most difficult book in the Bible. It's also difficult because it presents difficulties concerning authorship. The author calls himself John four times in the book. So we know John wrote it, but which John? Well, you might say, oh, isn't it the uh, son of Zebedee's, uh, John, the brother of James? Yes, I believe it was. But not all scholars have believed that. He doesn't say he's that John, and there were other Johns, and so there was always, even in the early church, even in the 300s and the 400s AD, there were Christian scholars who thought it was a different John. So there's been difficulties regarding his authorship. The date of writing. Actually, when we talk about the four views, you realize that the date of writing is extremely significant to some of these views. The two views are that it was written, the late date is it was written during the reign of Domitian, around 96 AD. The other view is an, the early date view, which thinks it was written during the reign of Nero in the 60s AD, like 25 years earlier or more. You say, well, what does that matter? Well, it doesn't for some of the views, but it does for some. So we're going to have to, that's a difficulty that has to be settled. Uh, the historical setting, the relation of the book to other books attributed to John. Did the book of Revelation, was it written, written by the same guy who wrote the book of Gospel of John and the epistles of John? I believe the answer is yes, but that too has been disputed by Christians throughout history. Um, it's acceptance into the canon of Scripture. You know, the, the canon of Scripture refers to the approved list of, of New Testament books. The book of Revelation was not finally accepted by the church as belonging in the New Testament until the Council of Carthage in 397 A.D., almost 400 years after Christ, finally the book of Revelation was accepted in the canon. Now, it was written in the first century, 
And the church had it for a long time before that, obviously, but they weren't sure. Some, some Christians thought it was, and some thought it was not supposed to be in the canon. And therefore, that wasn't even settled finally until three, almost 400 AD. And that being so, that means there were Christians for 400 years who didn't have any particular view of the book of Revelation. Some of them didn't even know it to be a book that belonged in the Bible. And if they did know it, they didn't all have the same opinion about it. You know, sometimes we get the impression that if you don't have the same view as your pastor or teacher of, of Revelation uh, has, uh, maybe, you're, you're, maybe your soul's in danger. There's a very famous teacher, I won't name, uh, who lives in the area where I live, uh, who, who teaches very strongly a particular view of Revelation. And he actually tells his congregation that if, if that's not true, and if you don't get this right, your salvation might be in jeopardy, he said. Now, then what in the world did the first 400 years of Christians do without even, having, without even knowing if they should believe in the book of Revelation or not? Obviously, different views of Revelation do not challenge your salvation. But there's something to be said for learning what it means, and that sometimes is difficult. And, of course, the main difficulty that people differ over is the, the uh, interpretation of the symbols in the book. I said it's paradoxical, partly because it's difficult, but it's also because it's the only book in the Bible promising a blessing to those who read it and keep its words, as, as you probably know. It says, uh, blessed are those who read the, the book and, and keep its words, for the time is near. Now, it's unique in another way. We have in our Bible books of prophecy. We have other books in our Bible that are epistles, letters. We also have a, a few books that are what we call apocalypses. We have only one book that is all three, and that's the book of Revelation. And when we say it's a, a, a prophecy, uh, we can see that it says so itself. In uh, Revelation 1, 3, John said, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written it for the time is near. So it's a prophecy. What do we know about prophecy in the Bible? Well, prophecy is written for the edification of the church. That's what Paul says when he says, he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men in 1 Corinthians 14, 3. And Revelation does that. It's, it's, it exhorts, it edifies, and uh, it, it uh, comforts people. It's a prophecy in that respect. But it's not only a prophecy, it's also an epistle. And you see this, for example, in verse 4. It says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. This is the same way that uh, all the epistles begin usually. It usually has, um, oh, excuse me, I'm going to get back to that. I'm not going to get into that in detail. I'll get back to it in a moment. In, in Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, we find it's also an apocalypse. The word apocalypse is an anglicized version of the Greek word apocalypsis. If you were raised a Catholic, your Bible calls this book the apocalypse. And that's a good name for it. Revelation is simply a translation of that word. Apocalypse comes from two Greek particles that mean a, a drawing away of the covering or an uncovering, an unveiling. Things that are there but weren't seen until you pull the veil away. That's what the word apocalypsis means. And Revelation is that. It's an apocalypse. And it says in the opening verse, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, which he gave to show his servants things that must shortly take place. Okay, so we have a single book that is a prophecy like, say, Isaiah and Jeremiah and the minor prophets are prophecies. It's also an epistle, like Paul's epistles or John's epistles or Peter's epistles. And it's also an apocalypse, which is very much like Daniel or Zechariah and, and also a number of other books that are called apocalyptic, which we'll have more to say about in a moment. Now, concerning it in its first category as a prophecy, prophecies have two things they do. They foretell the future and they foretell the word of God. Now, the, the word forth tell is not really a, a common English word. It means to speak forth. It means to proclaim. Prophecies, if you read the Old Testament prophets, of course they predict future things, but they also preach an awful lot. They preach against sin. They preach that people need to repent. Uh, the, the Old Testament prophets mainly were sermonizers, and their works were punctuated by predictions. Prophecies do both. 
And Revelation does both. It foretells the future, as it tells us in uh, the opening verse, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. It's predicting things that were going to take place after it was written. It also foretells the word of God, uh, as you see in the chapters 2 and 3, which have the seven letters to the seven churches, where Christ gives his his word prophetically, but not, not predictively, to the churches. Like he says, uh, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, the Spirit is speaking to the churches, and not everything he's saying is actually um, predictive. When we consider it as an epistle, as I mentioned, it has, among other things, the form of an epistle. Chapter 1, verse 4 says... John to the seven churches. That's a very common epistolatory kind of opening. In verse 11, uh, Jesus says uh, to him, um, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, Asia here is not the continent that we call Asia. It was uh, the Roman province of Asia Minor, which is essentially Turkey today. So these were churches all in Turkey. Uh, And to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. So this is a letter sent to these churches. The book also ends like most epistles. The last verse in chapter 22, 21 is, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. If you look at the end of almost all of Paul's epistles, that very line, that very statement is how Paul ends his epistles. So the book begins and ends like an epistle, and it contains seven specific epistles. The book is an epistle because the whole book is for all seven churches. And no doubt because seven is the number of completeness by implications for all churches, the complete church. So we've got a prophecy and we've got an epistle. Now, what do we know about epistles? Well, this is, for one thing, the only epistle in the Bible that's dictated directly by Jesus. It's the only epistle from Jesus. We have epistles from Paul, from Peter, from James, from Jude, from John, but it's the only one that's from Jesus. And we know it's from Jesus because he says so. He says, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven gold lampstands. He's identifying himself. That's, by the way, Jesus. Uh, He also says, uh, these things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Obviously, this is Jesus talking to the churches. He says, uh, also, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. That's Jesus, too. And each of the seven letters actually begins with him identifying himself as the sender. And therefore, it's the only epistle from Jesus that we have anywhere. But another thing we know about epistles is that their primary relevance is to the original readers in their life setting. When Paul wrote to Corinth, when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, when Paul wrote to the Galatians or the Philippians, he was making reference to things that were going on in those churches. In fact, um, we, we call most of these letters uh, occasional documents because they're, they were occasioned by something going on. The first meaning of any of the epistles in the Bible is that it's addressing something to the original readers living in the first century that was relevant to them that they needed to hear. And we should assume that if Revelation's an epistle also, perhaps it is too. Maybe it's relevant to the original readers. We can certainly see that chapters two and three are where we have those seven letters. But also, um, I'm going to skip over this here. He he continually says, I know your works and so forth. So he's dealing with them where they're at. But the last thing about epistles is that epistles, though they initially address things to the original readers, they also have abiding relevance to other Christians and churches that have similar circumstances. When we read Corinthians, we read that there's a man living in a sexual relationship with his father's wife. Now, there's not a man doing that in my church where I go. I know because I go to a very small church and we would know. (laughs) It meets in my home, so I would definitely know. But the thing is, there is such a thing as immorality in the modern church. It may not be that specific kind of case. But what Paul says about that case, we would use as normative to speak about similar cases. So it's very clear that When we read epistles, we're reading somebody else's mail because things are alluded to that are not familiar to us. Greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so. I don't know these people, but they did. And so an epistle is first and foremost to the original readers, and secondarily, it's, it's 
principles and uh, lessons can extend to similar situations for all of us. And when anyone, any Christian preacher teaches from the epistles, that's what they point out. Here's what was going on in Galatia, but here's what we need to know about the problem so we don't have the same errors they have. So that's, that's same with Revelation. We should assume that Revelation being an epistle to these churches would be relevant to them, but also it would have um, relevant to us too in a secondary sense perhaps. So when he says several times at the end of each epistle in, in chapters two and three, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's interesting that each church has its own circumstances that are addressed, but he says to each of them, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, it's not just the original church that's written to, but other churches may learn something from it too. And that's true, of course, all the epistles in the Bible. Now, I said it's a prophecy and it's an epistle and it's an apocalypse. Now, this third category is the most important for us to grasp because it's the most unfamiliar. We, we have other prophecies in the Bible. We have other epistles in the body, but we don't have much, uh, at least we don't know much about how to deal with an apocalypse. What is an apocalypse? Well, the book itself is called the Apocalypse. That's the name of the book. That's the first words in the book in the Greek language, the Apocalypsis. Now, the word apocalypsis or apocalypse or apocalyptic has become a, a category of writings in scholarship. There are a lot of what they call apocalyptic books. Now, in their day, they weren't called that. Scholars have called these books apocalyptic because they resemble Revelation, which is the apocalypse. So actually, there were lots of these kinds of books written by the Jews and by the Christians two centuries before Christ up until about the end of the first century, a period of about 300 years, from about 200 B.C. to about 100 A.D. There were lots of books. We have them. I mean, we have lots of them. Scholars have studied them. I've read some of them. You can read them if, if you get a hold of them. And uh, they all are of this particular unusual type. They resemble Daniel and Zechariah in their style. And no doubt, although these were uninspired books written during the intertestamental period, they probably were copying the inspired books of Daniel and Zechariah. They probably got their ideas to use this kind of a, um, a way of expressing things from actual biblical books. But during the 400 years before Christ came, there were no prophets writing books. It's called the intertestamental period. Some people call it the silent years after the close of the Old Testament and before John the Baptist and Jesus came along. But the Jews were not silent. God was not prophesying during that time, but the Jews were still writing religious books, and, and in the, especially the last two centuries of that period, 200 B.C. forward to Christ, and then another century into it, the Jews wrote lots of books that were very much like Revelation, had all of its characteristics, and we're going to see how that is so. Because the, the Christians to whom Revelation was written, when they read it, it wouldn't strike them as so bizarre as it does a modern reader, because they read lots of books that sounded very much like the book of Revelation. And scholars, recognizing that the book of Revelation was written according to a certain genre that was popular, although they didn't have another name for that genre, they just gave that genre apocalyptic, named after the book of Revelation, though it's kind of retrospective top uh, label. But it's an apocalypse, an apocalyptic book. And we saw that he says that, the revelation or apocalypsis of Jesus Christ is what it's called. Now, let me tell you about apocalyptic literature, because if you don't know anything about apocalyptic literature, you'll have no idea what to do with revelation, and you'll just be guessing. And most people do not guess very accurately. In the two centuries just preceding the time of Christ, the Jews produced many uninspired works which resemble the book of Revelation in style or genre. Because of this resemblance, scholars refer to these books as apocalyptic literature. It is probable that this genre arose in imitation of inspired books like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, and Zechariah. Obviously, I'm repeating myself, but I wanted you to have it in front of your face as well as in your ears. There we go. Um, all such books shared certain characteristics. Like what? Well, they claimed to be written by famous individuals of the past. Several apocalyptic books were claimed to be written by Ezra. Some of them are in the Catholic Bible. They're called First and Second Esdras. Esdras is the Greek form of the name Ezra. So the authors claimed to be Ezra, but weren't. They lived a long time after Ezra was dead. There's several books that claim to be written by Enoch. 
If you've heard of the book of Enoch, that's simply actually first Enoch. There's other Enochs, but none of them were written by the real Enoch. It was commonplace for writers to attribute their books. They'd write them anonymously and claim to be someone famous from the past who wrote them. And that's what the book of Enoch is like. We call it pseudepigrapha literature. You don't need to memorize that word. Uh, probably never use it again in your life. But pseudepigrapha means written under an assumed name. And all the apocalypses, except this one, were written under an assumed name. Now, how do we know that this one was not written under an assumed name? Because the author doesn't claim to be someone famous from the past. He just calls himself John, which was not a very uncommon name. He apparently assumed that he was a famous enough John that people would know who he was. He wouldn't have to say which John he was, but he's not, uh, you know, he's not claiming to be somebody else from the past at all. And that's one difference between Revelation and the other apocalypses, but the others all are pseudepigraphal. Secondly, these books were all highly symbolic, containing dreams or visions, using animal symbolism, mythical, astral, or catastrophic images to describe history, the unseen realm, <clears throat> or the future. Now, what they were describing sometimes were ethereal things, but most of the time they're just describing earthly things, earthly conflicts. So when Daniel, you know, talks about in Daniel 8, uh, a he-goat with a great horn between his eyes, and he attacks furiously a ram that has one horn larger than the other, and he kills the ram. And the horn on this he-goat breaks off, and four horns grow up in his place. It's kind of a weird, you know, Aesop's fables kind of sounding thing, but what it's talking about is Alexander the Great conquering the media Persian Empire. Now, this is the way the apocalyptic literature depicts kind of what we call ordinary things. But they have these impressionistic visions that uh, dramatize them in these symbolic ways. And thirdly, of these, the authors are always guided around by angels who explain the meaning of visions. You see this in the book of Revelation. All the apocalyptic books have this, the author uh, who is anonymous but claiming to be someone else famous, has angels telling him things. Now, of course, most of the apocalypses are not really inspired books. They're fictional. But the book of Revelation was written at the, at the end of a long period of the popularity of this kind of books, and God inspired John to write it in that way. It's a little bit like if we lived in a society where, say, science fiction was an extremely popular genre of literature. Maybe we do. And so, let's say someone will get some Christian information across by writing science fiction books. If you're a C.S. Lewis fan, you know that he wrote a space trilogy that's just that. It's a Christian message written in science fiction genre. Or, if you read the Chronicles of Narnia, he was getting Christian messages across by writing in the genre of fairy tales. And so, John was inspired to write in the genre of apocalyptic, which was popular at the time. Now, let me just give you a, uh, some specific instance that will help you understand. I don't know if this letters, these letters are too hard to read. I, I'm going to read them to you. Of course, I'm, I'm sorry the print's not larger. It couldn't fit much more on the page. Um, this, what we're about to read, is written a couple of centuries before Christ by an apocalyptic author. We don't know who he was, but he claimed to be Mordecai. Mordecai was Esther's uncle and a, a, a hero in the book of Esther. And somebody claiming to be Mordecai, but wasn't really him, claimed that he had a dream. And he reports this dream and in an epilogue. And it later was attached in the, in the years after Esther had been around for a while. Someone attached this as an, a prologue to the book of Esther. And then the same author wrote uh, an epilogue which got attached at the end of Esther. If you have a Catholic Bible, it will have these uh, apocalyptic prologues and epilogues attached to the book of Esther. The Protestant Bible doesn't have them because they're not inspired. They're not part of the book of Esther, not, not an original part. But they're wonderfully helpful to us in understanding how apocalyptic literature writes. Because listen to what this person claiming to Mordecai says. He's talking about a dream that he allegedly had. Whoops, I shouldn't have done that. He said, behold, noise and confusion, thunders and an earthquake, tumult upon the earth. And behold, two great dragons came forward, both ready to fight. They roared terribly, and at their roaring, every nation prepared for war to fight against the nation of the righteous. And behold, a day of darkness and gloom, tribulation and distress. 
affliction and great tumult on the earth. It continues, and the whole righteous nation was troubled. They feared the evils that threatened them, and they were ready to perish. Then they cried to God, and from their cry, as though from a tiny spring, there came a river with abundant water. Light came, and the sun rose, and the lowly were exalted and consumed, those who were held in honor. Now, there's many things about that prologue to Esther that sound like the book of Revelation. In fact, if I had told you that comes from the book of Revelation, many of you said, yeah, I could tell, you know. Sounds just like it. But it's not from Revelation. It's from a pre-Christian, uninspired prologue to the book of Esther written in the typical apocalyptic style. Well, what's it talking about for crying out loud? Well, you want to know? In the epilogue, the author, same author, describes what he was talking about. He says, I remember the dream that I had concerning these matters, and none of them has failed to be fulfilled. The tiny stream, which became a river, and there was light and the sun and abundant water, the river is Esther, whom the king married and made queen. The two dragons are Haman and myself. The nations are those gathered to destroy the name of the Jews, and my nation, this is Israel, who cried out to God and were saved. In other words, it's a summary of the book of Esther. If you know the book of Esther, it's just a story that doesn't have any magic, any miracles, any dragons, no, uh, you know, no fairy tale stuff. It's just a story of how the Jews were threatened in their Persian captivity by an evil man named Haman, and Esther, the queen, uh, was instrumental uh, to save them. It's, it's, a it's a great story, a wonderful story of God's providence, but it doesn't have any supernatural things in it. And yet... The first of these, thank you very much, the first, the epilogue here is the way that an apocalyptic writer would tell the story of Esther. And, and so we can see very clearly that these apocalyptic works use very symbolic images to talk about things that are more or less ordinary historical kinds of things, but important things. Not minor things, but important things, but they're still very natural things, historical events and so forth. Now, in the following respects, Revelation is unlike the inspired apocalyptic books, and that is it claims inspiration as a prophecy. The uninspired apocalypses did not claim to be prophecies, and it does. It identifies the name of its true author, John, rather than adopting a pseudonym, and uh, it makes a moral appeal and calls for repentance. The other apocalyptic works didn't call their readers to repentance. This is an inspired word from the Lord calling people to repent uh, and claiming inspiration from God and following the general genre of other apocalyptic literature. Now, let's talk, before we get into the four views, which we're going to do after, I, after we have a break, um, the elements of apocalyptic symbolism that we find in Revelation. Now, these are things that are very typical of what you find in all apocalyptic literature, but we know we find them in Revelation too. For example, people, nations, spiritual personages, like the devil and demons, are depicted as animals, for example, a lamb, a dragon, beasts, locusts. This is something that is very typical of apocalyptic literature. Another thing is that two women, a harlot and a bride, are featured and contrasted. They are also said to be two cities, Babylon and New Jerusalem. The, the bride is the New Jerusalem. The harlot is Babylon. Not the real Babylon, but mystery Babylon. And not the earthly Jerusalem, but the heavenly Jerusalem. So we've, we're talking about two entities, two spiritual phenomena that are likened to women and also likened to cities. Technically, they're not literal women or literal cities, but they are, again, a way of uh, apocalyptic symbolism depicting these things. Another thing is symbolic names like Jezebel and Egypt and Sodom and Babylon are used. That is to say... There's a woman in a church of uh, Thyatira who's called ba uh, Jezebel. Well, Jezebel was probably not her real name. After the real Jezebel, the infamous Jezebel from the Old Testament, I doubt if anyone in the church named their daughters Jezebel. <laughs> but the woman in Thyatira is very much like Jezebel because Jezebel introduced idolatry and fornication into Israel, and that's exactly what this woman is doing in the church of Thyatira. So she's symbolically called Jezebel. Uh, in Revelation 11.8, it says that the city where our Lord was crucified, which is not hard to identify, it was Jerusalem, 
it says it's spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. So we've got images throughout the book of Revelation of the judgment of Sodom. You have fire and brimstone many times in the book of Revelation. You also have images of the judgment on Egypt, like the plagues of Egypt. Most of the plagues of Egypt reappear in Revelation. And that's because some people believe this is talking about a judgment on Jerusalem, which is spiritually called Sodom and spiritually called Egypt, as it says in Revelation 11, 8. And then, of course, I just mentioned Babylon a minute ago. The harlot who is drunk on the blood of saints is called Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. But it's not really talking about Babylon in, you know, Iraq. That's, that's a, a different thing. In Revelation, there's cosmic disruptions. The sun and the moon go dark. The stars fall from the sky. 100-pound hailstones fall from the sky. This... You know, if it's literal, that's really an amazing thing. The problem is some of these things happen early on. You know, if, if indeed it's literally the sun goes out and the stars fall from the sky. By the way, how can stars fall to Earth? Do you know how big stars are compared to Earth? You can't have a star fall to Earth without ending the Earth. You can't have multiple stars falling to Earth. It's not literal. It's not literal. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 10 uh, Isaiah 34, um, uh, um, Jeremiah, I think it's chapter uh, 32, and other places in the Old Testament speak of the fall of places like ancient Babylon, Edom, uh, Egypt in the old days, and it speaks of them as if the sun goes dark, the stars fall from the sky. It's, it's not literal. The prophets in the Old Testament, as well as Revelation, speak of these non-literal things. And frankly, in the Old Testament, it's talking about something that's already historically happened. The fall of Edom happened 500 years before Christ. The fall of Babylon was like, you know, around that time too, not much later. And, uh, you know, the, the fall of uh, uh, Egypt to Assyria is what it's talking about, uh, or to uh, Babylon, I'm sorry, is mentioned in uh, Jeremiah 32 as also having darkened the skies, darkened the, the sun and the moon go dark and things like that. This kind of language is apocalyptic imagery. You find it in the Old Testament when it's talking about ordinary destruction of nations through military conquest. Uh, there's also numbers that convey concepts. Now, apocalyptic imagery uses a lot of numerology where numbers have not so much a mathematical meaning uh, or statistical meaning as a symbolic meaning. And there's lots of numbers. The most famous, of course, in Revelation is seven. There's seven of almost everything. There's seven stars. There's seven lampstands. There's seven churches. There's seven angels of seven churches. There's seven seals on the scroll. There's seven trumpets that sound. There's seven bowls of wrath. There's seven, seven, seven all the time. It's a very common thing. In fact, most scholars believe that Revelation divides into seven distinct segments of the book, too. Um, seven in numerology is the number of completeness or perfection. This is already established in the Old Testament many times. I have a few references here, Deuteronomy 28, 7 and 25, Psalm 12, 6, Psalm 119, 164, and Proverbs 9, 1, and Proverbs 24, 16. I don't expect you to look those up right now, but those, those all are cases in the Old Testament where seven simply symbolizes completeness. Uh, Proverbs 24, 16, for example, you know, uh, a righteous man falls seven times, but God upholds him. Well, literally seven times? Is that really how often a, in his lifetime a man falls? No. It means the total number of times that a man falls, God will sustain him if he's a good man. It's, it's, seven just means completeness. It's, it's a number that simply means that. It's not talking about literally seven of anything in particular most of the time. And so, there's also the number one-third, repeatedly. A third of the sea turns to blood. A third of the rivers turn to wormwood. A third of this, a third of that. A third of mankind dies here. Uh, in the Old Testament, a third, I believe, is already established to refer to simply a significant minority, not a literal third. Why a third for a significant minority? Because a third is the largest whole fraction under a half. Since it's under a half, it's a minority. Since it's the largest whole fraction under a half, it's a significant minority. Uh, it's a significant number, but still a minority. That's what I think a third refers to. You've got that 
uh, also found in Zechariah chapter 8 um, and, and some other places in Scripture. Uh, 12 and multiples of it, like 24, the 24 elders um, and so forth, or 144,000, which is simply 12 times 12 times 10. These are multiples of 12. There's also the 12 gates of the city, the 12 foundations of the city, uh, and so forth. The number 12 is also a number that's used generally associated with the people of God. God's people in the Old Testament were 12 tribes. God's people in the New Testament are led by 12 apostles. In the book of Judges, there were 12 judges, um, and so forth. The number 12, I mean, in the Old Testament, that was literal. But because of the literal 12-ness of the tribes of Israel and so forth, 12 then takes on the connotation of God's people in general. Um, a thousand years probably just means a long time. Now, that gets controversial when you get to Revelation 20, where Satan is bound for a thousand years. It could just mean a long time. Uh, a lot of people take it literally of a thousand-year millennium, but the truth is that in Psalm 90, in verse 4, it says, a thousand years in your sight are as but yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. Okay, so it's like yesterday or even like a three-hour period. A watch in the night is a thousand years to God. And of course, in the New Testament, in 2 Peter 3, 8, it says, uh, you know, to, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. A thousand years just means a long time. A day just means a relatively short time. In contrast to the 10 days in Revelation uh, 2, 10, which it says that the church of Smyrna will be, suffer tribulation for 10 days. We know of no such literal period of time. It probably just means a short but unpleasant period of time. In chapter 17, verse 13, it says that the 10 kings give their power to the beast for one hour, almost certainly not referring to a literal 60 minutes. Their career would be of no consequence if it only lasted for 60 minutes. Uh, and so we also have a little while in Revelation 23, which doesn't have um, any specific number. But the point here is numbers are not always literal. When you come to Revelation and find these different numbers, especially 7, 12, a third, and, and some of these others, like periods of time like that, you have to realize, well, that may be just impressionistic. That might be symbolic. It might not be actually statistical. Uh, it's not important. Now we have the four uh, approaches. And this is where we find out where we may be wrong. I've just been trying to tell you why we may be wrong. We may be wrong because we may be not recognizing what we're encountering when we encounter the book of Revelation. We, we, we just kind of read from the epistles on into Revelation, and, and you get all this strange imagery, and, and most of the Bible doesn't have that, really. I mean, there, is, there are other cases of it in the Bible, but most of the Bible is just historical narrative. More than half the Old Testament, more than half the New Testament are just historical narrative, and they're quite literal, telling events. So when you come to Revelation, you kind of want that to be that way. In fact, many... Teachers just say, well, Revelation is just history written in advance. Probably you've heard that line before. It, it, prophecy is just history written in advance. Well, sometimes it may be, but when we come to Revelation, we're not going to uh, be able to interpret it quite the same way that we interpret history because historical narratives are, generally speaking, literal accounts where uh, Revelation is going to be an apocalyptic style account of something. The question is, what is it talking about? And I want to tell you, before we take our break, that the four views, as I said, are not different views of when the rapture happens. The views about the rapture, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, all belong to one of the four views. And that's called the futurist view. Futurist. We'll look at that after we come back from break in more detail. And futurist means it's about the future. In particular, most futurists would say it's about the end of time, not just generic future, but specific future a few years at the end of time, and that's the futurist view. Another view, and the one that I said was the Protestant view for 300 years, which most of us have never heard, is called the historicist view. The historicist view. Actually, if you've ever gone to one of those Seventh-day Adventist uh, revelation seminars, they're just about the only people around now who still believe the historicist view. What is that? That's the view that Revelation's not about the end of time. It's stretched out over all of Christian time, from the time of John 
2,000 years ago, to the end of the world, whenever that may be, when Jesus comes back. The whole period, it's been 2,000 years now, that the whole period, 2,000 years and maybe more, is uh, depicted, and they identify things in the, in the early centuries of the church, in the early part of Revelation, the middle part of the church, age in the middle part, and later parts, they do believe there's future parts at the end, but mostly they think the book of Revelation is not about the future, although from our standpoint, they would say, you know, the future is the part that remains to be fulfilled. But they identify most of the seals and the trumpets and the vials with things that are now, for us, history. And they stretch it out over, over time. And like I said, this was the view of Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, John Huss, John Knox, Tyndale, Wycliffe, and it was, strictly speaking, the Protestant universal view up until about the 19th century. So, it, you know, you may have never heard of it. I hadn't before I began to study these things, but, uh, but when you hear about it, you say, well, that's a really weird view. Well, if you were born 200 years ago or more in a Protestant country, it wouldn't be weird to you. It'd be the only one that anyone you knew ever heard of, which is surprising. I'm going to say more about that view in a moment when we come back. Uh, the third view would be like the opposite of the futurist. It's called preterist. Preter is from the Latin word preter, which means past. And so a preterist is a pastist, just like a futurist is a futurist. You know, they, it, is it about the future or is it about the past? Preterism teaches that revelation is talking about things that happened not only throughout history, but very, that they're very far in the past. Some preterists believe uh, that although the, the events were future from John's point of view when he lived and wrote it, they're not future from our point of view at all. They happened in the early centuries of the church. Many of them believe that it was all fulfilled in the fall of Jerusalem, when Jerusalem fell in the Jewish war from 66 to 70 AD. Others think that parts of it are talking about the fall of the Roman Empire. The argument of those who take that view is that the, the Jewish synagogue and the Roman Empire were the two great persecutors of the church in the early centuries. And that Revelation tells the church, well, those two are going down. And they would sometimes say that uh, the first part's about the fall of Jerusalem and the second part is about the fall of Rome. Anyway, both of those things have happened in the distant past for us. And therefore, this is the pastist or the preterist view. And once again, you know, if you've never heard something like that, it's not like, well, how could that be? I mean, when were there ever locusts with tails like scorpions afflicting people for five months? Well, probably there never were, but there might have been something that those locusts represented. Remember, if we were talking about symbolic apocalyptic imagery, the question is not, has anyone ever seen the whole sea turn to blood before? Well, the answer would be no to that. But has anything happened in the past that might be depicted by an apocalyptic writer in those terms? That's the question. And, and that's where the preterists and the historicists, both the historicists and the preterists, are not taking them literal. They, they're, they're seeing it more as apocalyptic literature. And then the, the fourth view is going to be the idealist view. I might not take them in that order when we come back, but they're, the idealist view is not futurist or pastist or historicist. In fact, all of those views, the preterist view, identifies the visions with specific events that happened in the far past. The historicist view identifies the visions with specific events that happened throughout the church age. And the futurist view identifies the visions with things that they believe will be in the future for us. The idealist doesn't do any of that. The idealist says these aren't really talking about any particular events in history or the future. They are talking about ideas, doctrines. It's theological. It's, they say that there are events that, that illustrate these principles, but that the visions are not talking about those events, but about the principles. One of those, I'll just give you, and then we'll take our break. One of those would be uh, the, the sovereignty of God. For example, when, you, when uh, the first seal is broken, a voice in heaven says, come. And, uh, you know, a, a rider on a white horse comes out, and he's, you know, conquering. And then the second seal is broken, and another 
one of the heavenly inhabitants says, come, and out comes a red horse with a guy with a sword who slaughters a bunch of people. Then a third one of the elders in heaven uh, says, uh, or it's of the living creatures, I think it is, says, come. Out comes the, uh, the black horse, which seems to represent famine. And then the fourth one says, come, and out comes the green horse, which uh, is death and Hades falling. Now, these, they depict these calamities coming in judgment on the world because someone in heaven says, come. In other words, it's saying that the sovereignty of God brings these things about. These are, these are dictated from heaven. It might just seem like random aggression when one nation suffers from a conquest or from famine or from civil war or, or from plague, but, uh, but they're not random. These are being called for distinctly by heaven. Heaven is calling for this. And so uh, idealist would say, these visions are not telling us about any particular time when these wars or famines took place, but it's telling us that whenever they take place in all of history, it's because God is calling for them from heaven. And therefore, it's, it's pulling the curtain back to show us that things that we wouldn't know, things we see going on on earth, they're all, they're all being called for by God. They're, and that's a, a depiction of his sovereignty. That's only one of the things uh, I'll give you right now, I'll give more later, but um, so you can see these are very different. It's not like we've got four views about the end times. In fact, some people who haven't read my book, I think sometimes say, uh, Steve wrote a book about the four views of the end times. No, there's probably a lot more than four views of the end times, but only one view of the book of Revelation thinks it's about the end times at all. That's the futures. The other three views do not assume at all that it's about the end times. Some of them believe it's about very ancient history. Some believe it's about the whole of Christian history, and some believe it's kind of about transcendent truths that are manifested many times in many places in history, and, and uh, I'll, we'll, we'll have more to say about that. But I want to give you a break. There's some uh, snacks out there, I think, and uh, uh, actually, we're going to have some announcements first, though. Hey, let's thank Steve for the introduction. Thank you. Now, I... I have seen many of you taking notes and taking pictures of slides. There is one announcement that I will make, um, so let's just go to that first slide. I, I want to let you know, if you pre-registered for, um, for this event, um, you will receive not only the video recording of this, we will also be sending you a link to a Q&A that uh, Steve and I have already shot going into some deeper questions than we'll... The, than we're able to cover today, just in the seminar, you'll receive that. But in addition to that, I see you taking pictures of slides. Uh, Steve has given permission for us to send you his PowerPoint, so let's thank him for that. Um, we'll send that to you as well. Uh, so if some of you are scribbling, just understand, you will be getting that, but you need to go to this site and get registered so that we can make sure you're on the email distribution. Um, now, if you were here at the 11 o'clock service today, uh, when Pastor Shane had me get up and give a, a moment's introduction to this, I mentioned that if you came tonight or today, and when you leave, you will know more about the book of Revelation than over 50% of the pastors know, but you'll also know less than you knew coming in. <laughs> and that's because over 50% of pastors do not appear to know that there are these four views, or if they know, they, have, they could not tell you what the strengths or weaknesses of those views are, and you're going to hear those things tonight. And so you'll know something that many pastors don't. But on the other hand, you're probably going to leave with less certainty about the things you thought you knew already. And uh, I, I want to make this point clear, and this has a lot to do with my own philosophy of learning, uh, and I take it for granted, but I realize not everyone does. If you find that when I present each of these four views, you say, oh, that, that sounds kind of right, you know? And then the next one comes in, well, that also sounds right. <laughs> then you get to the third one, well, darn it, that one sounds right too, you know? And then when we get to the end, you, you know, they all four sound kind of right. Now I'm confused. Now, confusion is not of God. So how do you avoid confusion when you've got a, glut of information that you haven't fully been able to process yet. And I, there's a very simple answer to that. 
Do not be confused, just be undecided. There's a big difference. Confusion is a disorder of the mind, you know. I'm, I'm disoriented. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know how to navigate this at all. I'm, I'm in trouble here because I've... I wasn't confused when I came in. I'm confused now because I, I know I've heard too much. Well, you can just refuse to be confused. That's what I do. I mean, listen, I, this is not the only subject that I study lots of views of. I have another book on the three views of hell. And I haven't been able from, after doing the research for that and writing that book, I haven't been able to decide which one is correct. Uh, and, uh, but, but I'm not confused. I just am undecided. There's nothing wrong with saying, I haven't been able to make up my mind yet. I'm waiting for more information. And I might even wait till Jesus comes before I know. <laughs> I don't have to know this, you know. For the first four centuries, Christians did not have a united agreement about whether Revelation even belongs in the Bible. And then when they did, they didn't have a united agreement about what it meant. It simply is not one of the things essential to salvation. I think you'll testify that it is a matter of great interest and great uh, curiosity. <clears throat> but as you study and hear different views, and as you see, well, there's, there's more than one way this can be seen. Instead of saying, well, I'm, gonna, I'm just confused now. Just say, I have more to learn. I'll just remain undecided until I know. And uh, I myself studied these four views for many years before I came to my conclusions. And I actually have reached some conclusions about what I think about Revelation, but I don't, I don't, the reason I didn't promote them in my book is I don't think everyone has to agree with me. Uh, I, I don't think everyone has to reach the same view. Now, obviously, they can't all be right, but it's, if you're wrong, you're wrong about a lot of things, you know. <laughs> and it's entirely possible to go to heaven wrong. You won't be wrong after you get there, but you can be quite wrong about many things and still be entirely right with God. And, you know, if you keep a humble attitude and say, I'm, I'm a teach, i got a teachable spirit, I just want to know the truth, I'm not, I, okay, now I don't have enough information to make up my mind, well, I have to say I'm that way about a lot of things, even a lot of scriptural things. I mentioned I wrote a book on the three views of hell. I, wrote, I read eight books on each view in preparing, preparing for it. I know all the arguments for all three, and I don't know which one's right. I used to. That's the thing. The older I get, the less I know, or the more I know that I don't know. At least there's not so many things that I know for sure that just ain't so, you know? And so I want that to be out there before we get into this information because I got a feeling that some people, you know, we have a, it's probably a psychological flaw. We have an addiction to certainty about things that we don't have to be certain about. We need to be certain about God. We need to be certain about Jesus. We need to be certain about the will of God for our lives. We don't have to be certain about mysterious things that God has kept rather hard to understand. If that were necessary, then only the most brilliant intellects who could sort those things out could ever be saved. And actually, um, Jesus said, Father, I thank you. You've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Obviously, having a, a teachable heart like a child is more valuable to God than being able to answer all the questions and know everything. We need to know God, and we need to know Jesus, but we don't have to know all the things we'd like to know. But, it's, but this, if, if you can just be undecided and not confused, when, when you go from here, you'll have a foundation from which to do some very fruitful inquiry and further thought and study. And maybe you'll reach a, a conclusion. I have reached tentative conclusions, okay? I may change my mind again. I've changed my mind three different times in my ministry about what Revelation's about. I've held three of these four views. There's the fourth one I've never held. I don't know if I'm ever going to. I don't think so. But the point is, uh, it's possible you'll reach a satisfying conclusion, or it may be that you won't. But the one reason, again, I wrote the book, I, I, it, was, it was not my purpose to convince people of the view that I personally hold. It was my purpose to let people know that they don't hold, they don't know as much as they think they do. And that's a very helpful thing for a Christian to know. It's a humbling thing to know, but it's helpful. Humble is good. Okay, so the four approaches. Let's talk about those. 
Let's talk about the futurist approach. So this is the one that I, I would imagine everyone here knows. It's probably the only one that most of you have ever heard. It's the only one I heard growing up. And then when I entered the ministry uh, in 1970, it was the only one on the, on the radar in the circles I was in. The church I went to had a particular emphasis on Bible prophecy and end times and revelation. And uh, in that denomination, they teach on revelation more than they teach on any other book of the Bible. And they all have the futures view. And, you know, the way to be a prestigious pastor in that movement is to know more of the details than someone else does about how this little image in Revelation compares with, you know, relates to something that's going on in the Middle East or in Europe or in Russia or in China today. <clears throat> uh, and so this is the view that almost everyone knows. And to tell you the truth, although you may be more confused in some ways when you know other views, this view is, itself is confusing. And just if you, if you just assume the futures view is true, it has its own ability to be confusing because not all the futures interpret the same. As, as I mentioned, there's pre-tribbers, there's mid-tribbers, there's post-tribbers. They're all futurists. But what differences they have in terms of the, how they apply these events to the book of Revelation? Revelation has not yet been fulfilled. This is the futures view's position. It's about events that are so there to transpire at the end of the world. They point out, and this is correct, I think all the views would be okay with this. Revelation divides into three sections. According to Revelation 119, Jesus said to John, write the things you have seen. Now at that point in chapter one, John hadn't seen much. He'd seen a vision of Christ and he records that in chapter one. So in chapter one, he wrote the things he'd seen. He also said, and write the things which are. That is present things. And on this view, the present things refers to the things of the church age. The, the, the time of the church is the things that are. And they would say chapters 2 and 3, which has the seven letters to the seven churches, actually is his fulfillment of that commission to write the things that are. Then the third thing is, and the things which are to occur after these things. So Jesus said, write the things you've seen, the things which are, and the things which will occur after these things. Now, obviously, that's future. So he's told to write the vision of chapter 1 that he saw, the letters to the seven churches, which are the things that are, the church age, and then the rest of it is after the church age, after the church is gone, the things which are to take place after these things. Now, if in the second statement, if these things which are refers to the church, then the things that are after these things refers to after the church. And this is where you get an idea for a, a, a pre-tribulation rapture, that um, from chapter 4 through 22, you've got the future, after the church age. Now, since chapters 4 through 19 in particular uh, give it the tribulation, they believe that chapter 4, verse 1, is the rapture. Often the seven letters in chapters 1 and 2 are also viewed in a secondary way as seven successive ages of the church age until the end. I don't know if you've ever heard it taught that way, the idea that the church of Ephesus actually refers to the church in the first century, the apostolic church. And the church of Smyrna, the next one, talks about the church of the next two centuries under persecution, under the Roman emperors. The church of uh, Pergamos speaks of the church uh, under the power of the Roman, uh, the Roman Christian Empire under Constantine. Uh, the church of uh, Pergamos, I said that, of, of Thyatira, excuse me, is thought to be the papal church or the church that is under the popes. And Jezebel's there, and, and they consider that to be an apostate uh, church. That's why it was the Protestant view for so long. Because the Protestant view, which was the historic view, also takes this view of the churches. The, the futurists who take this view, futurism is a more or less new view, but it borrowed from the historic view, the idea that the seven letters refer to these seven ages. When you get to the church of Sardis, that's supposed to be the Reformation church. When you get to Philadelphia, that's the missionary church uh, of the, like, the 1700s and 1800s. And, uh, and then the church of Laodicea, you probably have heard, 
is the apostate church in the end times. So, so as you go through these seven letters, you're actually moving through the church age in their opinion. And therefore, the whole church age is covered in chapters one and two. And so we, it remains then to only talk about what will happen after the church age is over, when the church is raptured. That's, that's the thinking here. Now, let me just say, it's very fascinating the way that these different church letters can, in fact, be found to have some parallels with things the church was known for in these different eras. It's, it's quite a convincing thing that could be presented, but I would put it this way. The Bible doesn't identify that meaning of them at all. If, if we want to be Bible literalists, and, and usually the futurists are the ones who insist on being mostly Bible literalists, then you're not going to be able to say this letter to Ephesus represents the whole church from, of the apostles because it doesn't say that. It says it's written to a church in a specific town about things that are going specifically in that church. It doesn't indicate anything more. Same with all seven. Not, there's nothing in Revelation, nor frankly in any other part of the Bible, that would tell us that these letters have this secondary meaning. Now, you can see it that way if you want to. I'm not against it. But I can't, and I used to teach it because I was a futurist. But um, I would just say it's okay to hold it, but realize the Bible doesn't teach it. You're entitled to have that opinion, but just know it's a, a human opinion, not a divinely inspired opinion uh, when, when the teachers tell you that, okay? Now, uh, oh, I already get, went through this material. Ephesus is the Apostles' Church, Smyrna. I did this from memory, and I forgot it was in the slides. I'll just go through that. Okay. These PowerPoints are not for me. They're for you. I could give this without notes uh, just because I've done it so much, you know. So the rapture of the church is often seen as occurring in Revelation 4.1. Now, let me read that verse so you'll know why. After these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things that must take place after this. Now, the after this in the Greek is metatauta, which literally is after these things. That's the same phrase that we used in 119 where it says, record the things you've seen, the things that now are, and the things that will happen after these things, metatauta. And now we have chapter 4, verse 20, I'm going to show you the things that will happen, metatauta. And if, if these things means the church, then we have to assume now we're at the section that's after the church, and this would be the rapture. And John says in the next verse, um, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne in heaven. Now, in other words, there's a voice like a trumpet, a door open in heaven. He's caught up into heaven, and, he's, and they say that this is a picture of the rapture of the church. John is like the church being raptured. Many people have found that a very convincing argument, but they have not considered that John isn't always in heaven from this point on. In some of the visions, he's on earth again, and some he's between heaven and earth numerous times. So if John's movements represent our movements, and his caught, being caught in heaven means that we're caught in heaven, then we must be on the earth again too when he's back on the earth and so forth. Again, it's one of those assumptions that is not taught in Scripture. John is not said to be a picture of the church. But this is the way it's sometimes taught, and it's very, very persuasive sometimes if it's taught well. So that's, that's the verse I just read you. Um, after the rapture comes the seven-year tribulation period, depicted in chapters 4 through 19. This is the period of wars, cosmic phenomena, earthquakes, plagues of you know, various sorts. It's also the time of the Antichrist, who is identified as the beast from the sea in Revelation 13, 1 and following, who rules the world and persecutes God's people. Now, again, this is said to be a seven-year period of tribulation. I would point out that although Revelation has scads of sevens, there's seven of almost everything, the one thing you don't find in the book of Revelation is a seven-year period. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, if, if it's all about a seven-year period and it's, it's just thick with sevens through the whole book, it's just an interesting omission that there's no mention of a seven-year period. What is there? Well, there's five references to a three-and-a-half-year period. Sometimes it's called 42 months, sometimes 1,260 days. Sometimes it's called time, times, and half a time. But all scholars agree those are all ways of saying three-and-a-half years. So this three-and-a-half-year period is mentioned 
five different times in chapters 11 through 13. So those who say, well, this is a seven-year tribulation being talked about here, you got to take some of those three and a halfs and link them end to end with other three and a halfs until you got two periods of three and a half. Which ones belong to which is anyone's guess because there's not even an even number of them. There's five of them. And uh, those who are not futurists have usually seen the three and a half years as always the same three and a half year period. The idea of a seven-year tribulation is not uh, a consensus understanding of prophecy uh, throughout church history. It is a very common consensus today among futurists. But again, they do that by linking one of the three and a half years with another three and a half years and making seven. But they do it somewhat artificially because the book of Revelation doesn't link them in that way at all. For all we know from the book, it, they could always be the same three and a half years it's talking about. I'm not arguing that it is or isn't. It's just what, what we can prove and what we can't prove. Now, if someone says, but we know the, the tribulation is seven years long, not because of Revelation, but because of Daniel 9 and the 70 weeks of Daniel, right? Because the 70th week of Daniel is seven years. All the weeks of Daniel are seven years each. And then the tribulation is the 70th week of Daniel. So it's seven years long. Well, again, that's the standard line we get from the future. Daniel doesn't say that. Daniel never says that the 70th week is in the future or that it's a tribulation period. He said there's a 70-week period, which is 490 years. It begins some centuries before the time of Christ and presumably would have run out long ago around the time of Christ because it's 490 years, 70 weeks. But the future says, well, but 69 of those weeks, which is 483 years, did run out consecutively before Jesus came. But the 70th week was postponed for 2,000 years. And when the church is raptured, then that 70th week will bring in, and that's a seven-year tribulation. Well, I mean, if you say so, Daniel didn't say so. Again, these are, these are the people who say that we're supposed to take the Bible literally. If I take Daniel 9 literally, there's a consecutive 490-year period. There's nothing else. There's not a 483-year period and a 2,000-year gap and then a seven-year period. That's, that's not anywhere said in the Bible. It's not a literal, it's the way that the passage is made to conform with a particular assumption about Revelation and the tribulation period. And I just ask you, suppose, suppose uh, when this was over, I said, you know, uh, could you give me a ride home? Are you going south? I'm, I, I like a ride home. You say, well, how far away do you live? I say, well, uh, 10 miles. And you say, oh, yeah, I guess so. I got the time. I'll take you 10 miles. So I get in your car. We start driving south on 99. And we go nine miles, nine and a half miles, 10 miles, 11 miles, 15 miles, 20 miles, 100 miles. And you say, I thought you said you live 10 miles from here. I said, yeah, it is 10 miles, but I didn't tell you that between the ninth and the 10th mile, there's a gap of over 100 miles. I have a feeling you'd think I wasn't speaking very clearly and somewhat disingenuously. And I would think that the people of God would think that too if Daniel was told it's a period of 490 years. But I didn't tell you that between the 483rd year and the 484th year, there's a gap of 2,000 years. But this is what we're told the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say it. Some people believe the Bible means it and they're entitled to believe that. I'm not, I'm not here to really shame them. I'm just saying... I believed it, I taught it, until I studied it, thought, it's not there. This is simply a popular view of the modern times. Okay, so the pre-tribulation rapture view is specifically that of the dispensationalists. Not all futurists are dispensationalists. That's a view that arose in 1830 and is now the most popular view in America of the book of Revelation, it's called dispensationalism. And they are the ones who came up with the pre-tribulation rapture. But there are futurists who are not dispensationalists. A good friend of mine who's here with us today, is, he's a futurist, but he's not. Or no, no, he's not actually, but he holds some futurist ideas, but he's, he's not a pre-tribber. And, uh, and there are what people call the historic premillennialists who mostly see Revelation as the future. People like George Eldon Ladd and, uh, and, and many others. But they don't think there's a pre-tribulation rapture. They believe the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation. So it's only, uh, it's only the most common 
segment of the futures. The pre-trib rapture view is specifically that of the dispensationalists, but there are still many futures who are not dispensationalists and who do not hold that the church will be raptured before the tribulation. Now, on this view, at the end of the tribulation is the Battle of Armageddon, which is interpreted to be World War III, Revelation 16, verse 14 and 16. Actually, I think verse 16 is the only verse in the Bible that has the word Armageddon. Interestingly, too, because Armageddon is a word that means the mountain of Megiddo. Now, there is a valley of Megiddo in Israel. You can look down on it from Mount Carmel. I've seen it. Uh, and, but there's not a mountain called Megiddo anywhere. It's, you know, most, uh, most dispensationalists will say this is going to take place in the Valley of Megiddo. Yeah, but the book says the mountain of Megiddo, which is not the name of an actual mountain. I'm not going to solve that one, but that's one of those perplexities from Revelation. During the Battle of Armageddon, Christ returns with his previously raptured saints, defeats the Antichrist, binds Satan in the abyss for a thousand years, and then Jesus reigns on earth for a thousand years, so the so-called millennium, and that's in chapters 19 and 20. And after that, uh, at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed briefly and stages an abortive attempt to overthrow Christ's kingdom. Satan fails and is then consigned to the lake of fire. There's a resurrection of the dead and the great white throne judgment, and that's um, pretty much it. New heavens and new earth and a new Jerusalem. So that's how Revelation shakes out for the futures. You've got the first three chapters are relevant until the rapture. The rapture takes place at chapter 4, verse 1, and the rest of it happens after we're gone, okay? Now, the events are seen generally in their proper chronological order by the futures, though some would see two parallel sections, some that overlap or parallel accounts. Some think that chapters 4 through 11 are about... Uh, the tribulation, and then chapters 12 through 19 go over the kind of the same material in different ways. That's a special position of some of them. The advantages of the futurist approach, and the reason that I think there are so many, are A, of the alternative approaches, the futurist takes the most literal interpretation. Now, as I mentioned, they're not consistently literal, but they are more literal than the others are. Since they alone can do so, I mean, again, uh, there has never been in time an army of horses that had the heads of lions that shot flames and fire and brimstone out of their mouths to kill their enemies and had tails like serpents that bit people and killed them. That kind of an army has never emerged, but maybe it will in the future. If you're going to take a literal approach to these things, you're going to say, well, that hasn't happened, so it must be future. And that's the thing about futurism. You can take the book of Revelation as literally as you want to and say, yeah, it might not sound very realistic, but who knows? No one knows what the future holds. So if it's future, it would, you know, we can be a little more literal. If we take it as anything other than the future, we have to say, eh, this, is, this, this isn't literal. Couldn't be literal. So to, it, this clearly appeals to our tendency to take things literally and minimizes the difficulties of interpretation. Okay, so that makes it popular. Um, this view also encourages the reader to check and compare visions with current events and can usually be found to reward such attempts. In other words, if you think this is about the end times and then you assume this is the end times we're in, then you can look in, in the newspapers and, and say, I think that's what Revelation is about. That's what, and, and people throughout history have been able to do that with their own times. Not every year in church history, but hundreds of times in church history, there have been people said, oh, this war or this disaster or this Vesuvius blowing up and destroying Pompeii, this is what Revelation was talking about. You know, and as long as you're uh, looking for an end times fulfillment and you think you're in the end times, and most Christians have thought that during their times, you can kind of link it up with current events. But of course, since current events change from time to time, and all all ages can pretty equally do this. It raises serious questions as to whether this is the right procedure for understanding it. Third, it's widely held and taught by popular books, pastors, Christian media voices. It is currently the best known and most popular view among evangelical Christians in America. Now, if you listen to people on Christian radio, other than me, I'm on the radio every day, but uh, I'd be an exceptionist. Most of them are going to be teaching Revelation from a futurist view. 
Um, many large denominations have accepted the future view as their main view, or dispensationalism, which is a branch of futurism. For example, the Southern Baptists, the Assemblies of God, some of the biggest denominations in the world, Calvary Chapel is like the, one of the 10 largest denominations in the world right now, they're, strictly speaking, futurists. And so if you are a futurist, you are always in good company these days. And uh, if you begin to question futurism, you may find yourself on the outs with everybody you know. Trust me. <laughs> now, what are the disadvantages of the futurist approach? Well, there's a few. One is it renders the book of Revelation 90% irrelevant to us because it assumes that after the first three chapters, we're gone. Everything else, we're not here to see it. We're not here to experience it. It has nothing to do with us. It may be a letter to seven churches, but it really doesn't have much to do with the church at all. It's not like epistles, other epistles of the Bible that are relevant to the church, and that's one thing that some people think is a drawback to the future's view. It fails to recognize the symbolic character of apocalyptic literature, as we went over that. I think this is the problem. That I think it's the, a tendency to want to take things as literally as possible that tends to cement in our minds the conviction that this must be the future. But if you understand the symbolic nature of apocalyptic literature, then that difficulty disappears. It also struggles to explain some things uh, in the book of the book's own expectation of soon fulfillment. We've looked at chapter 1, verse 1 a couple of times. It says, these are things which must shortly take place. Well, when was, this, when was this written, 1985? No, it was written in the first century. And the author is writing to people who are reading it in the first century in seven churches in Turkey area. And he's telling them, these things I'm about to write, these are about to take place. These are shortly take place. He says in verse 3, at the end of it, he blesses the one who keeps the words of this prophecy because the time is near. Okay, so these are going to shortly take place. The time is near. And yet, if it's talking about things that are 2,000 years off, that was a little misleading, <coughs> I think. And that is a stumbling block and one of the things that causes many people to doubt that the futurist view is taking seriously the book's own statements about its soon fulfillment. And there's more of them than just those two we looked at. In fact, these are them. I, I read you those. But there's this one too, Revelation 22.10. He said to me, do, this is the angel speaking to John at the end of the book, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is at hand. Now, what's, if you've read Daniel, you recognize an interesting contrast because Daniel is told by an angel at the end of his book, you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Daniel is told, you don't expect a soon fulfillment of these visions we've, you've gotten. They're not coming soon. They're, off, hell, hell, they're going to come at the end. Later, the angel says, you're going to go to your grave and you'll, at a ripe old age, and in, your, in the proper time, you'll rise to your estate. You know, don't look for soon fulfillment. Just seal it up. The idea of sealing the book, Isaiah said something about sealing his book, too, in Isaiah chapter 8. He said, seal the prophecy among my disciples. What's it mean? The prophet is predicting something on a certain date. They roll it up, they put a wax seal on it with the date on it, and stick it away in storage. Why? Because someday someone will open it and say, wow, this hap is happening now because it's a later date. And look, it was prophesied on this date that's sealed. So the idea of sealing it is to establish the fact that it was written at a certain time so that at a much later time, when it's actually relevant, you can show that it was prophesied that early. And so Daniel's told, seal it up until the time of the end. But what's John told? Don't seal it. Why? Because the time is at hand. That, seem, that seems emphatic of what's already been said several times. The time is near. These things are about to take place. Don't seal the book because it's not going to be a long wait. Which again makes the future's view seem somewhat difficult because if it's true, then it has been a very long wait since the book was written. Okay, now, let's talk about the historicist approach. Remember, this is the one that 
uh, I told you about that was the, the, the Protestant view. Revelation, according to this view, is a sequential account of the whole of Christian history from John's day to the end of the world, written in advance. This approach arbitrarily adopts a day-for-a-year interpretation of the time elements of the prophecies. For example, 150 days in Revelation is considered to be 150 years in history. Uh, 1,260 days is supposed to be 1,260 years, and so forth. It's, kind of a, it's just kind of an assumption that the historicists made, that the days in Revelation represent years. Where did they get that idea? Well, to defend that principle, they, they quote two Old Testament things. Uh, one of them is where the spies searched out the land of Canaan for 40, year, 40 days. And when they came back and gave a bad report, God said, okay, I'm going to make you wander in the wilderness for 40 years, a year for every day that you spied out the land. Okay. The other occasion is in uh, Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 4, where it says that he lay on one side for 390 days and on the other side for uh, 70 days, or 40 days, excuse me, and these represent years. Each day that he lay on his right side was a prophecy against uh, Israel, and on his left side, you know, the uh, prophecy against Judah, and, and they're, they're, it, totally it's that many years. So a day of his laying on his side represented a year. Okay, so does that establish some kind of a prophetic principle that from now on, anytime the prophet says anything about a day, it means a year? Actually, those two things don't in any sense establish that. Therefore, I say it is an arbitrary approach, but it was a universally held approach among Protestants. And they identified the beast of course, is the papacy, uh, the popes, the papal institution. And um, the, the, the beast blasphemies continue for 200, or 1,260 days. And they said that's 1,260 years. So they said the popes arose around 600. So go 1,260 years forward. That's, that's in the middle of the 1800s. And therefore, they predicted, predicted the fall of the papacy in the 1800s. Uh, this is one reason there's not as many historicists today as there used to be. Um, According to this view, the breaking of the seven seals is the breaking up of the Western Roman Empire. Rome fell to barbarian hordes through four successive invasions uh, in the uh, fifth century. And, uh, and, and that the seals being broken, they can ingeniously uh, identify them as Attila and Alaric and, and Genseric and the other uh, uh, barbarian armies that came against Rome and it fell. Um, the seven trumpets describe the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire, that's Constantinople, which happened actually in the 15th century, but it, it, was, through, um, it was through Muslim invasions. First the Arabs, the first, um, like the locusts, the locusts coming out of the pit are thought to be the Arab hordes that came against Constantinople and did horrible damage. The, 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 the locusts torment people for 150 days. And they say that's how long the Arab uh, attacks on Constantinople, that's 150 years. And then, uh, th then after that, the, um, the next, the, the sixth uh, trumpet, it represents the Turks, the Seljuk Turks who actually conquered Constantinople in the 1400s. So that's what they do with that. Um, then we've got, um, okay, I mentioned that. The little book that's open in chapter 10 is thought to be the Bible being made accessible during the time of the Reformation with the printing press being invented. They could publish Bibles. People could get that, and the Reformation took place. The beasts of chapter 13 are, are the political and religious power of the papacy. In other words, the first beast and the second beast are both the papacy, but the first one speaks of the political power of the papacy and the second one the religious power. Uh, the seven bowls of wrath correspond to the crippling of the papacy, in the French Revolution in the 18th century. Now, by the way, when you get to those bowls in chapter 16 of Revelation, it specifically says these are the seven last plagues. So you kind of expect this to be the end of the world. And they run their course, and the, the historicists saw that as the French Revolution. But that was a few centuries ago, and the end of the world did not come yet. You know, you may have heard of people like the Millerites in the mid-19th uh, century, who went up on a hill because they had the date of Jesus. He was going to come in 1846 or something like that. 
and it was called the Great Disappointment. The, the Seventh-day Adventist Church came out of that movement, and they still take the historicist approach, but most people don't because of the Great Disappointment because they thought Jesus was going to have to come in the mid-1800s, and he didn't. What Ellen G. White did to keep the Seventh-day Adventists loyal uh, was she said, well, Jesus did come back uh, into, the, uh, into a, a heavenly judgment, uh, but, but he hasn't come back to earth yet. Well, you can modify your opinion, you know, every time the, the, the dates don't work out. Um, the fall of Babylon in chapter 17, 19 depicts the papacy falling, finally destroyed at the second coming of Christ. Now, th that's what it teaches. What are the advantages of this view? Well, there's a few. Uh, it was the view of all the reformers and of most evangelicals for over 300 years. It was long referred to as the Protestant view due to its widespread, almost universal acceptance. It is possible to identify striking historical parallels with the prophecies of Revelation. Just like the futurists like to scan the newspapers to find fulfillments in the future of Revelation, the historicists really like Gibbon's rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, Gibbon was an anti-Christian historian, but a very notable one, wrote several volumes about the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, and, and the historicist commentators can find many things about th that history that correspond in remarkable ways with different things in Revelation. Frankly, there's a reason why all Protestants held it for 300 years. There's a lot of very impressive parallels that they find. Um, <clears throat> and that's one of the strengths of it. Disadvantages of the historicist approach is basically the scheme ran out of historical parallels in the 1800s, which I consider to be a, a great weakness of the view. Also, those who hold it do not agree on the interpretation of many of the prophesied events, which would be strange after their fulfillment. Now, before their fulfillment, you might have any number of opinions, but after their fulfillment, it shouldn't be so hard. And that you don't find complete agreement among them on those. So those are disadvantages of it. So let's talk about the idealist approach now. The idealist approach, as you, I mentioned, is not really talking about connecting Revelation with any particular historical or future events. Revelation is not about any single event or events, past, present, or future, but it depicts symbolic visions of grand spiritual principles repeatedly borne out in history. According to this view, the great themes are illustrated without reference to specific historical events. Such themes include, as I said earlier, the sovereignty of God over the affairs of nations. That theme is certainly seen throughout the book of Revelation. Uh, the cosmic spiritual warfare. The book depicts a great dragon at war with Christ and the saints and so forth. And, and throughout the book, there's this spiritual warfare that's depicted. That is real all the time. That's not related to any one event. Spiritual warfare, we still have it, and they always had it. It's always, there's always this spiritual warfare going on. It also depicts the triumph of good over evil and of Christ over Satan. Of course, Christ is the victor over Satan. Even in our own lives, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. So it depicts Christ as the victor over Satan and of good over evil, ultimately. And it, the post-mortem, that is after death, vindication of the martyrs. There have been martyrs for Christ throughout church history, and people who bemoan their, their passing were encouraged, or are to be encouraged, they say, by seeing that John saw their souls in heaven. He saw the spirits of the departed martyrs in chapter 6, and he saw them again in chapter 20. And, and it's very clear, the promises that are made in the seven letters of seven churches to the suffering ones is that they'll be receiving the crown of life and so forth. So that one of the themes that's always true depicted in the book is that Christians who are faithful unto death are rewarded in the next life. Now, these are some of the themes that are there. Most idealists see the book of Revelation as being modeled after a Greek play having seven acts and each having seven scenes. Now, it is fairly natural to divide Revelation into seven sections, and most of them, or many of them at least, have seven subsections. So, for example, the first section is chapters 1 through 3. It has the seven letters of the seven churches. Second section is chapter 4 through chapter 8, verse 1. You've got the seven seal book and the seven seals. Then later on in chapter 16, you have the seven vials poured out, and that's another section and so forth. There's, there's a total of seven segments of Revelation that almost all views of Revelation 
uh, are, are okay with, because it, it's kind of a natural way to divide it. But the idealist view holds it, it's like a Greek play, a symbolic play, that's getting across these symbolic ideas, and, and that each, play, each act of the play has, has seven scenes. Uh, it's not always possible to find seven scenes in each of them, but obviously in several of them it's quite obvious. Um, each act, of this, et cetera, parallels the others in covering the same time frame, applying to the entirety of the church history, presenting different angles and different images, much as Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 do. Now, what Daniel 2 and 7, if you don't remember, Daniel 2 has Nebuchadnezzar's dream about an image with a head of gold, a chest of uh, silver, a belly of bronze, legs of iron, uh, feet of iron and clay, and a stone that strikes them in the feet. The interpretation of that is that the head of gold is the Babylonian Empire, the chest of silver is the Media Persian Empire, the belly of bronze is the uh, Grecian Empire, and the legs of iron are the Roman Empire, and the, and the stone is the kingdom of God established during the time of the Roman Empire. Now, when you get to Daniel 7 then, he sees those four beasts coming out of the sea, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a ten-horned beast. And they also represent the Babylonian Empire, followed by the Media Persian Empire, followed by the Grecian and the Roman Empire. So in other words, the same period of history is covered in both chapters with different images. And the idealists say that's what you're really seeing when you see the seven seals broken or, and the seven trumpets sounded and the seven vials. Those are all talk about the whole of church history. They're looking at the same period of time through different uh, imagery, different symbols. That's, that's what they would say. Each act also has some reference to the second coming of Christ and the end of time. So since the church age does end with the second coming of Christ, the idealist actually sees the second coming of Christ in several different places, or essentially one reference to it in each of the seven sections. So that's how they look at it. The best book I read on this was called More Than Conquerors by a guy named William Hendrickson, who is a, uh, a, a Dutch Reformed author. It is quite good. Um, and I've read quite a few books. Of course, I've read several books on all the views. Some are good. Some are very good. Um, now, the advantages of the idealist approach, of course, are that it eliminates the difficulty of harmonizing specific passages with specific fulfillments in history. That requirement has bedeviled all the other approaches. It is theological and or philosophical rather than prophetic or historical. It's a philosophical interpretation and theological, not historic and prophetic. The disadvantage of the idealist view is very simple. The book of Revelation itself claims to be predicting events that may shortly come to pass. So it's hard to say that the book doesn't talk about any actual events. Uh, now, many people have seen this and have felt like, well, the idealist view still has some great merit, and many people have mixed the idealist view with one of the other views. They say it is talking about specific events, but the idealist view points out that those events reflect overarching, transcendent, uh, always true principles. And so you can kind of marry this view to one of the others. Okay, um, now the preterist view. What's that one? Preterist means past. Revelation was fulfilled shortly after it was written in the fall of Jerusalem to the Romans in A.D. 70, and possibly in the fall of the Rome, Roman Empire as well, which both are now history, so it's past fulfillment. One school sees the entire prophecy as being fulfilled in the Jewish War, which was from A.D. 66 to 70, which was incidentally was three and a half years, culminating with the fall of Jerusalem. Another sees this as the subject only of the first half, chapters 1 through 11, and they see the second half, chapters 12 through 22, as being concerned with the fall of the Roman Empire. The message of the book is the vindication of Christ and the martyrs upon their persecutors. Remember, Jerusalem was the first persecutor of the Christians, Rome the second. Up until 70 AD, the main persecutors of the, of the Christians was the Sanhedrin, it was the Sanhedrin that killed the first Christian martyr, Stephen, but that was after they killed Jesus. And then they sent Saul of Tarsus out to persecute Christians other places, and he went with their authority to bring people to jail and, and persecute them. Uh, when Paul himself became a Christian, they sent people after him. And when he went to town and preached somewhere, the, it was the synagogue, the Jews, who persecuted him. 
Some of them were out-of-towners who were sent from the Sanhedrin who came to town. They followed him to Philippi and to Thessalonica and, and to Berea, and they'd, they'd uh, hound him. And, and it was always the case in the early days that the only one persecuting the church were the Jewish uh, Sanhedrin, Jerusalem. Now, why didn't the Romans persecute him back then? Because Rome had a law that any religion that was present before the Romans took over the area could stay. But no new religions could come into an area after the Romans had come in. Now, obviously, when Christianity arose, the Romans had already been there, so it would technically be an illegal religion. But Judaism had been around before, so they were legal. In the Roman Empire, Judaism was legal because it was pre-Roman era, and Christianity was not. But the Romans had a hard time distinguishing between Judaism and Christianity because they were the only two monotheistic religions. All other religions had many gods. And the Christians worshipped the same god the Jews did and worshipped a, a, a Messiah who's the Jewish Messiah. And they started their movement in synagogues and so forth. And, and, uh, and the apostles were Jews. And so the Romans, when they saw the Christians, they just thought, well, that's just another branch of the Jews. Now, the Jews tried to tell them it wasn't because the Jews recognized them as something else. But the Romans didn't until Jerusalem fell in 70 AD. Then it was clear that Judaism ended, that is, biblical Judaism, because there's no temple, you can't continue it. But Christianity still flourished. And the Romans recognized, wait, these guys are, there's, Christianity is not the same thing. And then they targeted the Christians for persecution. So the first persecutors were the Jews for several decades, and then the next persecutors were the Romans. And the, the theory is, that the book is talking about the fall of at least of the, of the Jews uh, in Jerusalem and, and possibly of Rome, the two persecutors, and God's vindicating his people from their persecutors. Uh, it says, for example, in Revelation 9, uh, 6, 9 and 10, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? He sees the martyrs in heaven saying, Lord, when are you going to judge those who killed us? And the answer is, they're told to wait a little while, but the idea is that this is what Revelation is depicting. Uh, in chapter 17, he says, I saw a woman, Babylon, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Later it says, in Revelation uh, 19, or 18, 20, Rejoice over her, that is Babylon, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Babylon, when she fell, was God avenging the apostles and prophets. Well, the apostles were slain either by Jerusalem or by Rome. Uh, it says in chapter 19, verse 2, he has avenged her blood uh, uh, of her, his servants shed by her. So the idea is that Revelation is talking about God avenging the, the saints on their two great persecutors, or maybe on one of them. Now, advantages of this view. One, it makes the most sense of passages like chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 19 in the Greek. Actually, in the Greek, chapter 1, verse 19 says this, write the things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things which are about to take place after this. Now, in our translation, it just says that are to take place after this. But in the Greek, it's the word mellow is there, which means about to. And so they say, well, John wrote about what was going on in his time and the things, the future things that were about to happen. And uh, then I also read for you chapter 22, 10, where the uh, angel says, don't seal up this book. These, the things are going to happen soon. The time is at hand. It also makes the book of Revelation relevant to the original readers because many of them lived through the period it's talking about. Like most epistles, it's relevant. Uh, three, it makes this, it, it agrees in subject matter with the Olivet Discourse. You know the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, about wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, and, and the abomination of desolation, all that. Well, obviously, Revelation seems to be talking about a lot about similar things, maybe the same thing. In fact, almost all views... Futurists, preterists, historists, almost all of them agree that the Olivet Discourse is on the same subject as Revelation. In fact, many scholars of different views have called the Olivet Discourse 
the little apocalypse. It's interesting that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have the Olivet Discourse, but John didn't record the Olivet Discourse. And one theory is it's because he already had written the book of Revelation. Why, why include the cliff notes when you've written the whole thing, you know? Now, the point is that there's a good case to be made that the Olivet Discourse and Revelation are about the same thing. And what is the Olivet Discourse about? Well, it begins in Matthew 24. Uh, the disciples say, look at the stones of this temple. And Jesus said, well, no, not one stone, stone of these is going to stand on another. They're all going to be thrown down. That actually happened. The Romans did that in AD 70. And the disciples come to say, when will this be? And he gives an answer in the Olivet Discourse. And that answer includes the statement in verse 34, this generation will not pass before all these things take place. Now, he was speaking in 30 AD. It happened in 70 AD. That's 40 years later. It's a very specific time-sensitive prophecy. And that's what the Olivet Discourse is talking about. Now, Revelation doesn't say these things will happen in this generation, but it does say they'll happen soon. They're about to happen. And, uh, and, and the contents of Revelation is very much parallel in many respects with the Olivet Discourse. So preterists believe there's good reason to apply Revelation to that same subject, the fall of Jerusalem, as the Olivet Discourse. Um, and Eusebius, the early church historian, just said, it's fitting to add to these accounts the true prediction of our Savior in which he foretold these events. That is in a passage where he's describing 70 AD. And he says, Jesus' words were as follows, woe to them who are with child and them that give suck in those days, but pray that your flight not be in winter, neither in the Sabbath day, for the then shall be great tribulation such as has not been since the world began uh, until this time, nor ever shall be. Now, Eusebius wrote in 325 AD. He's the earliest church historian we know of except Luke, who wrote Acts. He's in this passage talking about the Jewish war and the fall of Jerusalem to the Romans. And as he tells about the fall of Jerusalem to the Romans, he says, it's fitting to add that Jesus predicted this. And then he quotes Matthew 24, including the statement, then shall be great tribulation. Obviously, Eusebius, speaking no doubt agreeable with the church of his time, felt like what happened to the Jews in the, in the Jewish war was what Jesus was calling the great tribulation. By the way, Jesus never said how long the tribulation would be. He just said there would be great tribulation. So, and, uh, so it's just interesting that the earliest church historian we know of besides Acts, um, he assumed Matthew 24 is about the fall of Jerusalem. And if it is, there's another argument for Revelation being about that. Another advantage is that it agrees impressively with the history of the Jewish war recorded by Josephus. Just like the historicists like to reference Gibbon's rise and fall of the Roman Empire, preterists like to reference Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish historian, not a Christian. He'd never read the book of Revelation, but he wrote an extensive, he was an eyewitness of the Jewish war. He was a participant in it and later became the historian of it. He wrote a very detailed history of the Jewish war called Wars of the Jews. It's still available. And you can read it. And there are very many places where Josephus says things that are almost verbally the same as what Revelation says on certain things. And even though he didn't know the book of Revelation, he had never seen it. So some people say, well, see, the things happened the way Revelation said. Josephus, an impartial witness, records that. All right? It also renders the book intelligible when it talks about imp the emperors. Now, th this is something... In Revelation 13, 18, we have the mark of the beast is 666. This is said to be the mark of a man, the, the number of a man's name. This is talking about a phenomenon called the gematria. In ancient times, sometimes people wrote in code, and they would take the numeric equivalent of the letters in their language, and this could be done in Hebrew, it could be done in Latin, it could be done in Greek. Each, in those languages, each letter in the alphabet has a numeric equivalent. And sometimes they use the alphabet instead of numerals. And so it was a commonplace for people to write in code, changing a word into the numeric equivalent of its letters. So that, for example, archeologists have found in ancient Rome something like a graffiti that says, 378 loves 494. <laughs> we don't know who those people were, but. That's an example of someone taking a person's name and the letters of them and reducing it to its numeric equivalent. And John at that time says, 
this is the number of a man's name. It's 666. Now, obviously, in my lifetime, that number has thought to apply to Henry Kissinger, Ronald Reagan, um, of course, Mussolini, just before my time. Mussolini, you know, my parents' generation thought it was Mussolini. Um, and, and many others. King Ferdinand of Spain or something. There's a whole bunch of people that people try to show their, they, they look like they're probably the Antichrist and therefore we can make 666 their number. I, I don't remember Ronald Reagan's middle name, but it had six letters and so does Ronald and so does Reagan. So his whole name is six letters and six letters. Six, oh, that, that's the mark of the beast, the, the number of his name. Yeah, I think he didn't last long enough for that. But if you turn the name Caesar Nero into its Hebrew equivalent, the numbers add up to 666. Now why, if it was Caesar Nero, would it use Hebrew letters instead of, say, Greek or Latin? Well, the, the, the theory is the, the writer didn't want Caesar Nero to know he's talking about him this way. <laughs> and therefore, if he wrote it using either Latin or Greek, enumerations. The, the Romans knew those. They didn't know Hebrew. But many people in the church did know Hebrew because there were a lot of Jews in the church. So, and remember John says, uh, he that has wisdom, let him calculate the number of the beast. It's the number of a man. Now wait, he thought his readers reading in the first century could figure out who he's talking about if they're smart. He's writing to first century Christians saying, now those of you who have got wisdom, Calculate this number and you'll know who I'm talking about. And the preterists believe he's talking about Nero. And that, that never worked. Now, uh, we don't know of any other ancient person that that number would work for. So preterists think it's Nero. Now, if it is Nero, that means Nero was the, was the emperor at this time, which is just before Jerusalem fell. Because Nero committed suicide in 68 AD and Jerusalem fell in 70 AD. So if this was written during the reign of Nero then it was just before Jerusalem fell. And since the prophecy said these things are about to take place, you know, the beast is this man. If it's, you know, that, that's how they argue it. Now, chapter 17, verse 10 is interesting, too, because in chapter 17, verse 10, it talks about the seven heads of the beast. And they are seven hills, but they're also seven kings. And it says of the seven kings, five have fallen... One now is, and another is yet to come. Now, many scholars think that he's talking about emperors. When he talks about there's seven kings, five have fallen, one now is. Now, notice John, again, living in the first century, writing to people in the first century, one of these guys now is reigning, he says. There's seven before him that have fallen, but the sixth one is presently reigning. And then there's more to come after that. Uh, and... If it was Nero who was reigning at the time, then he was, in fact, the sixth emperor. There were five emperors before him that died, and then Nero was the sixth. So many people feel that those statements, the 666 and the reference to the sixth king, uh, sixth emperor, they take it to be, uh, means that Nero was reigning. And if Nero was reigning, that was just before Jerusalem fell. And therefore, the book could easily be predicting that event, is what they're saying. Um, what are the disadvantages of the Preterist approach? Well, it is claimed by critics of the view that it originated with the Jesuit Luis de Alcazar in the 16th century in order to refute the reformers. Remember, the reformers held that the beast was the papacy, right? The popes. The popes are the beast as far as the reformers are concerned. That's the historicist view. And all the reformers and all the Protestants were historicists. That, the popularity of that view in the 16th century kind of made the, made the Pope look bad, you know? If, if he's the Antichrist, uh, you know, that kind of spoils his reputation. So, so a Jesuit, a Catholic writer, wrote a book on Revelation and said, no, this is not the Pope. This is about something that happened back in 70 A.D., and it's Nero. And that Jesuit was Luis de Alcazar. 
Now, what's interesting, I didn't mention this when we talked about the futures view, the futures view also arose at the same time, written by another Jesuit named Francisco Ribera, for the same reason. Because the Pope was being made to look so bad by the reformers teaching that he's the Antichrist, Catholics came up with two alternative explanations. One was the preterist and one was the futurist view. And, said, and, and the future said, no, he's not the pope. This is an individual who's going to come up in the end times. That's going to be the Antichrist. So these two views are said to both have come from Jesuits to refute reformers. Now, it is true that Louis de Alcazar did do that, and Francisco Rivera did that, but the preterist view did exist before him. In fact, uh, in the 6th century, which is a 1,000 years before Alcazar, there was a commentary on Revelation uh, by Arethus, and he said this, as he's talking about Revelation, some refer this to the siege of Jerusalem by Vespasian. Okay, that was when he was talking about Revelation 6.12. He says, this is, some people say this is about the fall of Jerusalem. This is in the 6th century, 500s AD, a lot earlier than Alcazar. Then on Revelation 7.1, Arethus writes, Here then were manifestly shown to the evangelists what things were to befall the Jews in their war against the Romans in the way of avenging the sufferings inflicted upon Christ. So again, a very early writer said it was about the fall of Jerusalem to the Romans. In Revelation 7.4, 4, Arethus wrote, When the evangelists received these oracles, the destruction in which the Jews were involved was not yet inflicted by the Romans. In other words, he's saying Jerusalem had not yet fallen at the time that this was written. And he's already said that some of, those, some of the visions there, he believed, were about that. So we have a very early witness to it in Arethus, uh, which is a lot of time earlier than Alcazar. Now, what are, another disadvantage, and this is, <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, this is the only true possibly fatal disadvantage of the preterist view. And that is, most scholars, they don't believe that Revelation was written in the reign of Nero. They believe it was written in the reign of Domitian. And that was in the year 96. Now, it's quite obvious, if John is writing in 96, he's not predicting something that happened 25 years earlier. He cannot be writing about the fall of Jerusalem if he's writing at the end of the first century, because the fall of Jerusalem was not something to predict. It was something in their past. So the late date of Revelation is fatal to preterism. Now, most modern Bible scholars do choose the late date for Revelation, but not all. This is very much a contested matter. And we're going to talk about that. What was the date of writing and what's the evidence for it? And this is, I think, how we're going to wind this up. There are two theories, as I mentioned earlier. There's the early date, which was during the reign of Nero, which is, of course, prior to A.D. 70, since he died in 68. The other is the late date that says he was, it was about uh, 96 A.D. in Domitian's reign. Now, if you have a, a study Bible, like a NIV study Bible or an NLT study Bible or something, if you look at the notes at the beginning of Revelation, they'll say, Revelation is written around 96 A.D. That is almost the consensus of many evangelicals in our day. That was much less so in former times. And the, and the evidence, I'll tell you, uh, I've, in weighing the evidence, I read two doctoral dissertations by different men defending one or the other. One of them is by a, a, someone defending in his doctoral dissertation the early date. That was Ken Gentry in his book, Before Jerusalem Fell. Very thorough, analyzes the book of Revelation, gives all, and the external evidence, gives all these arguments for it being the early date. And another one is Mark Hitchcock, who's a dispensational futurist, and he wrote his doctoral dissertation defending the late date. I've read his too. So I've read two doctorate level arguments for Eight, one for each. And once you hear all the arguments, the most you can say with certainty is it's still open to question. 
it is still open to question. We're going to look at the evidence for these, but I'm just telling you in advance. After you look at the evidence, it's still open to question when it was written, all right? So the evidence for an early date, which is, of course, necessary for the preterist. By the way, the other views don't need the early date. If you're a futurist or a historist or an idealist, it doesn't matter when it was written. It could be written early, late, it doesn't matter. But the preterist view is absolutely defend, dependent on the early date because if it's not written before 70 AD, then it's ridiculous to say it's predicting 70 AD. Now, notable advocates of the early date include the old commentator, Wesleyan commentator Adam Clark, Alfred Adersheim, famous for writing The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, J.B. Lightfoot, a very, a very great scholar, John A.T. Robinson, who's a bit more liberal, but he's a, a notable scholar. He believes all the books of the New Testament were written before 70 A.D. Uh, Philip Schaff, great historian, Lutheran historian. Uh, J. Adams was a Presbyterian, uh, mostly famous for writing books like Competent to Counsel and a whole bunch of other books about Christian counseling, but he also wrote a book on Revelation that I read years ago called, uh, the, I think it was called The Time is at Hand, and, and he took the early date. Uh, he was a preterist. And there were many others besides these guys. Now, it seems to agree with the situation that you read of in the, the seven letters for seven churches, because two of the churches, Smyrna uh, and uh, Philadelphia, seem to be persecuted by the members of the synagogue in their town. Their main trouble seems to be coming from Jews in the synagogue. In both cases, Jesus says to these Christians, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews, but are not, and who lie, but who are the synagogue of Satan. And that expression is used in writing to the Philadelphian church and to the uh, Smyrnian church. And uh, the Jews persecuting the Christians would be much more likely to be a, a reality before Jerusalem fell than afterwards because the Jews were greatly demoralized by the loss of the temple and their kingdom. I mean, not, it's not just Jerusalem fell. The nation of Israel ceased to be the nation of Israel. Their nation was destroyed. Their religion was destroyed. The temple's gone. These people didn't have so much chutzpah after that as before. And therefore, since the, the tension seems to be exist between the Christians in some of these churches and the persecutors who are of the synagogue of Satan, but who say they're Jews, and Jesus says, but they're not really. Just like Jesus said to the Jews in, in John 8, I know you're descendants of Abraham, but if you were the children of Abraham, you'd do the works of Abraham, but you're of your father the devil. And see, John said that, in, uh, Jesus said that in John 8. John brings it up again here. Um, so it, it seems like the problem with the Jews uh, persecuting the church might fit better with the early date than with the later date. Uh, the fact that the temple seems to exist. In chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, John says, I saw a temple, and I was given a measuring line, and I was told to measure the temple, and, and so forth. And, and the measuring meant the part you measure is going to be destroyed, and the other part's going to be surviving. And um, so it's talking about a temple that was not destroyed. Now, most futures say, well, that's a future tribulation temple. The thing is, there's no specific reference, certainly not in Revelation. In fact, this is the only reference in Revelation to the temple on earth. Um, uh, there's no reference to a future temple. I know it's standard fare for dispensational teaching, but there simply is no clear prediction in the Bible, not the Old or the New Testament, that there will be a third temple. Many people understand Ezekiel chapters 40 through 47, the temple vision of Ezekiel. Some think that's going to be a third temple. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14 talks about a temple and people worshiping, and, and many people apply that to the future. But I don't apply those passages to the future. I don't think the context encourages that application. But nonetheless... There's no unambiguous reference in the Bible to a third temple. And certainly nothing in Revelation would indicate that the temple he sees is not the one that was standing at the time and that was about to be destroyed. And so certainly, I mean, it could be seen otherwise, but the most natural way to see it is the temple he sees is the temple that existed since he never mentions another one anywhere. Uh, and that would be before 70 AD then, time of Nero. Number 666, I've already talked about that. It can, it can be made to be Caesar Nero in the Hebrew enumeration. It doesn't work with Domitian. Um, the current king I mentioned, the sixth king, five have fallen. That, that, that would point to Nero. Again, it doesn't point to Domitian. Um, the multiple assertions of an immediate fulfillment 
Of course, that, I've, we've pointed that out. There's several assertions. This is going to be fulfilled right away. The time is near. Don't delay. Don't seal it up. Jerusalem's destruction was impending before 70 AD, but history has shown that nothing of earth-shaking significance was impending in AD 96. In fact, scholars who believe uh, that, that it was written in 96 have sometimes taken the more liberal approach, saying, yeah, he was talking about immediate destruction. He just missed his prediction. It didn't happen. Because nothing happened. After Domitian's time, nothing immediately happened that's remotely like this. In fact, for several centuries, nothing did. So if he says, this is going to happen right away, well, it could refer to the fall of Jerusalem if he's writing in 70 AD earlier, but it doesn't naturally find fulfillment in anything shortly after 96. So that's, that's an issue. Um, okay, now let's talk about the evidence for the late date, 96. Notable advocates of this date include Robert Mounts, Albert Barnes, B.B. Warfield, Donald Guthrie, John Walford, Merrill Tenney, perhaps most other commentators since 1900. And certainly most study Bibles will take that approach. Uh, they say that chapter 13, where the beast is requiring people to worship him, applies best to Domitian. They say in, in chapter 13, there's evidence that there was enforced emperor worship. And Nero never required people to worship him, as far as we know, but Domitian did, they say. So that suggests possibly that Domitian was the emperor, not Nero. Also, the extent of the persecution. They say Nero only persecuted Christians in Rome, but he didn't persecute people outside of Rome, but Domitian did. Now, I would point this out. It is true that the churches in Asia were suffering persecution, but it doesn't say they were suffering it from Rome. Uh, the church of Thyatira had, law, or Pergamum, excuse me, had lost one of their bishops to local persecution. A man named Antipas had been killed uh, before the letter was written, but it wasn't by Nero. It was local persecutors. Uh, and so the persecution in Revelation is never specifically said to have come from uh, the emperor. But more than that, Many scholars say there's no evidence in history that the persecution of Do that Domitian launched was beyond Rome either. When they say, well, Domitian was the one who had a worldwide persecution, uh, history doesn't really bear that out either. So that's controversial. It's thought to be a plus for Domitian. There's also reference to the Nero Redivitus myth. Now, this is a very strange argument, it seems to me. It is known from certain Roman historians that when Ro Nero died, there was an expectation among many superstitious people that Nero wasn't really dead, that he was going to come back with the armies of Parthia and conquer Rome again. And there was this fear that it's going to be like a revived Nero. Now, they see this in the statement that the beast had a head that had received a mortal head wound, but it lived. And they say that is referring to that famous redivitus myth of Nero that we know from secular sources was a, a rumor that was held back then. And they point out that Domitian was often referred to as a second Nero or a bald Nero. That, the, his contemporaries sometimes call him a second Nero. So the idea is, oh, this is clearly talking about Domitian because he's the second Nero. And, and this suggests that the beast is going to get a head wound and... Uh, and survive and so forth, and it probably is an allusion to that myth. But hey, let's think a minute. If it is, then the prophecy is not inspired, because Nero didn't come back, first of all. And you know, if it's if it's if if that myth inspired John to write something like that, well, then John was just wrong, and he's following mythology. But some modern scholars don't mind that because they're liberal. And, they, and that's the way they argue. And that's one of the, uh, a big argument they use for the later date. Now, I want to say this, too. The beast did not die in Revelation. It had seven heads and ten horns. One of its heads received a mortal wound and apparently died. It still had six good heads. The beast, the beast is not an individual man in Revelation. The beasts of Daniel are not individual men. The beasts of Daniel are kingdoms. The beast in Revelation is like a composite of all the kingdoms of Daniel. It has seven kings. 
It has 10 more kings that are the horns. This is a political system. It's not an individual man. And the idea that it loses one of its heads, yeah, a king can be killed and the empire can live on if there's more heads around. So there's no, you know, you know the Left Behind series. They suggest, you know, the Antichrist is assassinated. He dies, but then he comes back to life. It's based on this business of the head wound and he lived. The Bible doesn't say the beast died from a head wound. It says he lived on after he received the head wound because it wasn't the only head he had, all right? So uh, the wealth of Laodicea. Laodicea suffered an earthquake shortly before the time of Jerusalem's fall and was fairly impoverished because of it. And yet the church of Laodicea says, I'm rich, I have need of nothing. So they say it wouldn't be saying that in Nero's reign. They'd be, that'd have to be later on. Well, I'm wealthy and have need of nothing is what the church is saying, not what the city is saying. They're basically a little proud of their success, and they don't know they need God anymore. That's why they're lukewarm. Uh, the existence of the church of Smyrna is an interesting one because Polycarp was at a later date the bishop of Smyrna. And he wrote a letter to the Philippians in the second century, and he said to them, to the Philippians, among you the blessed Paul labored, who are praised in the beginning of his epistle, meaning the epistle to the Philippians that Paul wrote. So Polycarp's also writing to the same Philippians, but he says, you guys earlier heard from Paul, and he praised you in, in the beginning of his epistle to you. For concerning you, he boasts in all the churches who then alone had known the Lord. For we had not yet known him. Now, what it's saying is that the church of Smyrna did not yet know Christ, is what this is understood to mean. But he wrote this um, shortly after the time that, um, how do I argue this point here? It, it doesn't make much sense. They're saying that the church of Smyrna did not exist in Polycarp's day. And yet it did exist when Revelation was written because a letter was written to it. So they say Smyrna came around later than 70 AD and it can't have been written before. That's the argument. But Polycarp didn't say that the church didn't come around in Paul's lifetime, but it, didn't, it, didn't, it hadn't been founded uh, at the time that Paul wrote his letter to the Philippians. So it's a different kind of claim. Paul wrote his letter to the Philippians probably between 60 and 62 AD. Polycarp is saying the church of Smyrna didn't exist when Paul wrote that letter. Okay, but they might have come into existence before 70 AD still. Churches are being planted all the time. Um, the spiritual decline of Ephesus and Sardis and Laodicea. Ephesus had left their first love. Sardis had a name that it lived but was dead. And, of course, Laodicea had become lukewarm. What they're saying is this. These churches were founded in the time that Paul was in Ephesus. Paul died around 67 A.D. These were fairly young churches in 70 A.D. They hadn't been around long, less than a decade probably. So how would these churches, if it's written before 70 A.D., how, the, how would these churches so quickly have deteriorated? I think it's a very naive, naive question. I've, I'm 70 years old. I've been in lots of churches. I've seen some startup churches, some church plants. I've seen churches that went bad in less than a decade, especially if going bad means they l left their first love. I have, I would even say, having been in the Jesus movement in some respects, some of the Jesus movement churches uh, have become lukewarm since then or, or has left their first love. But the thing is, a church can go bad almost overnight. Paul wrote to the Galatians and said they had forsaken the gospel and embraced another gospel. They were estranged from Christ. And this was only months after he'd left them, after he'd founded them. The church of Corinth had all kinds of problems in it within a year of the time that Paul founded them when he wrote the letter. So churches can go bad fast. The fact that Ephesus, Sardis, and Laodicea had some problems, even though they're fairly young churches, it's too... It's too naive to say they couldn't have gone bad uh, so quickly. That had to be a later date. Now, here's the main thing that has to be considered. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple, a disciple of John. And Irenaeus wrote something that is usually quoted in favor of the late date of writing. He said, 
since this number, talking about the mark of the beast, 666, is found in all the good and ancient copies of Revelation, and since those who have seen John face-to-face -face testify, we will not incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of Antichrist. For if it were necessary that his name should be distinctly revealed in this present time, it would have been announced to him by him who beheld the apocalyptic vision, meaning John, for that was seen no very long time since, but almost in our own day toward the end of Domitian's reign, in other words, around 96 AD. Now, Irenaeus says something was seen around that time, 96 AD. What was it? Well, just before saying that was seen, he says, he speaks of the man who beheld the apocalyptic vision. The argument here goes, the apocalyptic vision was seen by John near the end of Domitian's reign, not long ago, he says. But is that what he's talking about? It's a little ambiguous, but some people think he's talking about John was seen not very long ago. When he says that was seen, he means that man, that apostle, that, that evangelist was seen not long ago. Meaning, he's not telling us when the book of Revelation was written or seen, but when John was last seen. Now notice he's saying, if John wanted us to know, he would have told us. After all, he was seen not so very long ago, almost in our own time. And so some, notice he said, since those who have seen John face to face testify, and that it would be announced by him who beheld the apocalyptic vision, for that was seen. What? John or the vision? Some think he's referring to John and not the vision. And one of the reasons he says that, they say that, is that he refers to all the good and ancient copies of the book of Revelation. Now, if, in, if he's talking about in his day, there were good and ancient copies of Revelation. Now, the copies themselves were ancient. The original would have been much more ancient than the copies. And yet, he says, whatever was seen was seen not very long ago, almost in our own time, in Domitian's reign. In other words, if he's saying Revelation was written in Domitian's reign, but he also says that wasn't very long ago, how could there be good and ancient copies of the book that was written not very long ago? That's what one wonders. Whereas if it was John that was not seen very long ago, but the book was written a long time ago, there could be very good and ancient copies of the book, and yet John was actually seen much more recently than the time the book was written. That's, that's how people argue. It's, it's a complicated thing. Which way did he mean it? I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. Um, so in summary, you've been waiting for this, I'll bet. For many centuries, four different approaches have competed for legitimacy concerning the book of Revelation. Men and women of very great stature in the evangelical church can be found within each camp, both now and throughout church history. Most of these views predate the approach that is best known and most popular today. In other words, the futurist view is the most popular today. Most of the other views, all of them, were earlier than that. They, they were held earlier by scholars and Christians and so forth. Most Christians today only know the popular view and are completely unaware of the other three. Wrong button. It is difficult to determine which of these approaches is most ancient since complete commentaries of Revelation were not produced prior to the fourth century, and by then more than one view can be found alluded to by different writers. The oldest might have been some combination possessing elements of two, three, or four of the known views. We don't know what the original view of the church was because the first four centuries produced no complete commentaries on the book. Remember, it wasn't even in the canon of Scripture until almost 400. It is therefore impossible to claim that one's own position was that which was held by John's first readers. Even the question of the millennium seems to have been disputed in the earliest centuries. Our decisions about which view or views to embrace must come from our own examination and assessment of the scriptural evidence, that is, from exegesis of the passage. Now, here's the conclusion. You thought we were there already, right? No. Let me review in conclusion. Futurists see Revelation as a preview of the end time. Historicists see it as a panorama of history from John's time to the end of the world. Idealists view Revelation as a series of visions affirming timeless principles repeatedly observed in world events, and preterists see it as predicting 
the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, and possibly also of Rome in the 5th century. It is never, it's never necessary to be confused, even about matters that are difficult to decide. Every essential matter is clear in Scripture. Some non-essentials are less clear and may require years of meditation and study to clear them up. The fact that this is in the unclear category means it's not essential for your salvation or your Christian faith. I'll tell you this. I mentioned I have held three of these, different, three of these views in the course of my 50 years of ministry. Changing my view never changed anything about my life. No matter what view I held, I still follow Jesus the same. I don't follow Jesus because I believe the revelation a certain way. I follow Jesus because of Jesus, because I'm his disciple, because he's the Lord. And that's what makes me a Christian. That's what makes me saved. But it doesn't matter what view of revelation I have. I can still follow Jesus. Now, I'd rather be right than wrong in thinking about revelation, but that's a luxury we may not have immediately. It's something yet to learn. And I love to learn, so I, it, it intrigues me to have things I still don't know. Instead of allowing too much information to create confusion, one would do well to simply remain undecided on matters that require more time to be sorted out. Fortunately, no essential Christian doctrine rests upon our correctly interpreting the book of Revelation itself. It was not even universally accepted in the canon for the first three centuries after Christ. Every teaching of Scripture necessary for life and godliness can be learned with certainty from the remaining books of the Bible to focus disproportionately on the correct interpretation of Revelation has distracted many from actually doing the things that we've been told to do. There are whole ministries that talk about nothing else than Revelation and end times. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you should be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We have an assignment, and that assignment is not to be distracted by things that are not ours to know. And, and when I find whole ministries focusing intensely on end time stuff, which are definitely in that category of the things that the Father has put in his own authority, I think, how could we go so far wrong? See, I'm not focusing on end time stuff. I'm focusing on what's Revelation about. Is it about end times or something else? It's just a study of the book. But there are ministries that focus on end times almost completely. And, and Jesus specifically said, it's not for you to know. So move on. Move on. Keep thinking about it. Meditate on Scripture day and night. You might end up getting some insight into this. You might want to study it out. You might want to get my book. <laughs> I don't sell them, so you have to get it somewhere else. Amazon has them. All right? So that's the end of my lecture to you, and we want to have... Thank you. We wanted to have some q and I'm going to let you decide how much we do of that, okay? Okay. Hey, just before we're done, Steve, don't go too far because we're definitely going to uh, keep using you for our closing minutes. But a couple things I just want to say. Number one, we're putting this up on the screen again, northpoint.org front slash revelation because we want to get registered so that you can have access not just to this recording for your review, but as I said earlier today, we did a separate Q&A diving a little deeper into some, some specific questions uh, that I know I come across through you. Uh, lots of people ask. Um, and I think you'll enjoy that. But... Um, in addition to that, you will also be able to receive the PowerPoint. Thank you for that, Steve. Um, I do want to mention that you can also, just a couple of announcements, and then we're going to allow for a few questions, and then we'll be done for the evening. But, um, but I also just want to mention, uh, Dennis McCord is here, and uh, I met Dennis. And Dennis uh, is in charge of a radio station, 1550 AM, uh, KXEX, is that right? Yeah, and uh, he, you are on every day from 2 to 3. I am. Is that right? 2 to 3 on the radio every day, okay? So that's 1550 uh, KXEX, and uh, we're just excited that you're here. And, uh, yep. and if we don't get to your question tonight because of the shortage of time, my, my show is an hour every weekday, 2 to 3. It's all Q&A. You call in with a question, you'll get an answer on the air immediately. There you uh, go. Been doing it for 27 years daily. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Now, 
Steve won't do this, uh, so I'm going to take the opportunity to do this. First of all, we are not selling books uh, here tonight, uh, but I do want to mention this. I mentioned in church today, may, you may not have been here for church today, but uh, this book has been life-changing for me. You can get this on Amazon, Revelation the Four Views. And uh, his introduction, which his introduction is 57 pages, uh, but his introduction... <laughs> really covers a lot of the content of this seminar, and uh, it is outstanding. It, it is worth the book just for the introduction, but that's even before you start going through chapter by chapter into the book of uh, Revelation. But uh, Steve, I just want to, and we may only have time for two questions for the lucky two, but I, I want you to give um, people an idea of this other book, because when we were at dinner last night, uh, I was fortunate that because we were at dinner, he gave me a copy of his newer book, Empire of the Risen Sun. And he tells me that as, as important as that book is, this is, his, uh, this is the most important book you've ever written. Or, Could will you, write. or will write. Could you describe what this is about? Okay. I, I don't write a lot of books, but I've written about five, and I'll probably write some more. This, the Revelation book was the first. I've, I've got several others. But a few years ago, I wrote two books on the kingdom of God. Both of them are called Empire of the Risen Sun, book one and two. And the first one is explaining what Jesus meant by the kingdom of God, what it is, and how it's the central focus of Jesus' teaching and of the gospel. And most Christians don't know what it is. Everyone here, how many of you ever heard the expression kingdom of God? Everyone. Now, how many of you could stand up and tell me exactly what is meant by that phrase? Very few. Most Christians are like that. That's why I wrote a book, because uh, I, that's been my main study for 50 years is the kingdom of God, and uh, Revelation is just a side study. This book uh, talks about the kingdom of God, and it talks about discipleship. The first book is about the kingdom. It's called, uh, book one is uh, There is Another King. Book two is called All the King's Men. It's about discipleship in the kingdom. And uh, this book has both of the volumes in one. You can get it this way, or you can get the two volumes separately. They're all available at Amazon. The overall title is called Empire of the Risen Sun, S-O-N. Yeah, it's wonderful. And stay right there, uh, if you would. I also want to mention that we are now... Uh uh, advertising and getting people prepared for I, our Bible Institute here at North Point. So I just wanted to make sure that we had referenced that. Uh, go online to northpoint.org and slash NBI. I know here we have lots of graduates. In fact, some of those graduates uh, went to dinner with Steve last night. That's right. Let's hear it for our Bible Institute. It's amazing. Um, our, senior, our, our founding pastor, for many years, our senior pastor here at North Point, started our Bible Institute, and uh, I got to say, uh, it, it, he is an amazing teacher, and uh, he has some amazing teaching assistants, and so it really is the college equivalent of a four-year degree when you go through it. We had, I want to say, 49? Am I right about that? 49 graduates, uh, or right in there. How many, Susan? 41. Okay, well, it should have been 49, I guess. So. <laughs> 41 is an amazing number of graduates. So it was just so exciting to see those that graduated. So get enrolled in our Bible Institute, and uh, let's, let's start loving God's Word. Colin, are you uh, ready with a microphone? Uh, we're going to have time for maybe two or three questions before we need to be done. But uh, if you have a question, we're going to do, Pastor Steve said this the other day, if you remember the old show Phil Donahue, where he would run to people with a mic. Uh, we're going to do that, Colin and I, at both sides of the room. Anybody just have a question that they want to ask? Yeah, right up here. I'm going to start here. And again, we're not going to get to all of you, but we have a radio station you can go to. Yeah, yeah the uh, date of Revelation. Uh, Revelation 2.13 mentions the martyrdom Antipas. As far as I know, that was in uh, 93 AD. Is this correct? The martyrdom of Antipas, you say, was in 92 AD? Uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs does mention Antipas. Uh, most commentators say that the Antipas that's mentioned, though, is not that Antipas, and that, and that this Antipas that's mentioned in Revelation is an unknown, other, otherwise unknown to us. Now, I don't know if they're right about that. You're right. If Antipas that was killed in 92 AD mentioned in Fox's Book of Martyrs, if, if, if he is the one Revelation is referring to, then that would definitely make Revelation a later date. Yes. Good. Someone else. Here. Oh, yep. Uh, you mentioned that the book of Revelation uh, is not necessary for salvation. But in regards to the mark of the beast where it says those who accept it will be tormented with fire, um, do you think that it's important to know what that is? And do you think that God wants us to understand it? You know, do we have to know what the mark of the beast is to avoid hellfire? Um, 
that depends on what we th think it is. Um, I'll tell you what, I am, I'm not of the view that the mark of the beast is a chip put in your hand or forehead. But just in case anyone comes to my house and requires me to take one, I'll say no, okay? Um, there's, there's several different views of what the mark of the beast is, but all of them have something in common. Every view of the mark of the beast is it's something that is a betrayal of Christ and a loyalty to Satan's system. Now, I don't have to know what the mark of the beast is because I'm going to avoid every betrayal of Christ and everything that would smack of loyalty to Satan's system. So, you know, if, if a person goes to hell for having the mark of the beast, it's not because they got a chip. It's because they betrayed Christ by getting it. You know, when, when you think about it, let's just take the view that it is a chip and you, and you can't buy or sell uh, without this chip. And, and if you don't have it, you're going to go to hell. Does that mean that your salvation basis on, is based on how you pay for your groceries? Well, what if your, what if your uh, debit card counts as a mark of the beast? That's cashless. You know, I mean, I don't think that God sends people to hell because of how they buy their groceries. He sends them to hell because of his disloyalty to him and their loyalty to Satan. And that's what the mark of the beast suggests. No matter what form it takes, it is a disloyalty to Christ. And that's that's what sends people to hell. So if it ends up being what people sometimes think it is, well, that also would be recognizably disloyal to Christ. Now, if someone says, well, what about the vaccine? You know, what about the COVID vaccine? Is that the mark of the beast? That's a popular view that came out. I can't see how it would be because I can't see how anyone taking that vaccine is thereby saying, I renounce Christ this day because I don't want to get COVID. Well, uh, frankly, I, do, I didn't get the vaccine, and I, I, and I won't unless they hold me down and force it on me. But if they do hold me down and force it on me, I'm going to go to heaven anyway, okay? Yeah. Yes. As a child, I always wondered about the scripture that says that the two witnesses were observed by the whole world. And I, I wondered, how could that be? And now with the cell phone and like live feed on Facebook or whatever, I wonder, is that um, a fulfillment of that? I think there's still some tribal people in the Amazon and in, in, the, in, in Africa that don't have cell phones yet. But I'm sure that Apple will get to them. Uh, the, the two witnesses, I don't have time to go into what that could be. There are four views of who the two, what the two witnesses are. <laughs> but I will say this, that in Revelation, sometimes the whole world means the whole Roman world. For example, in, in Luke chapter 2, it says that a decree went out in the days of Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be taxed. Well, Caesar Augustus wasn't taxing the Incas or the Australian aboriginals. He was, it was the Roman Empire. The, to, the whole world in, in the New Testament often means the Roman Empire. So uh, anyway, that, you'd have to look at the different views to get a, a complete answer to that question. Yeah. You mentioned about the, uh, there's no future mention of the temple. Um, I'm an MBI student, so I recently learned something there. Um, do you see that there's no more mention because our Lord God is the temple and we are, the temple is in us and we are the temple, we become the temple at that time? Interesting, yeah. I mean, is it that the Revelation doesn't talk about the temple more than it does because we are the temple now? Yeah, actually, the temple became obsolete, which is why God allowed the Romans to destroy it and why he's allowed it to not exist for 2,000 years almost. Uh, it's, it's of no value. It's, it's, it's obsolete because Christ dwells in us. As Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 5, we are living stones being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. And so uh, many times in the New Testament, it says we're the temple. In, in 1 Corinthians three sixteen, Paul says, do you not know, church, that you are the temple of, the, of God? Uh, and he says it again, 2 Corinthians 6.16. So, yeah, I think the, the us being the temple has totally equ eclipsed any value or significance of any earthly temple. And Stephen said that before they stoned him. That's why they stoned him. They didn't like him saying it. He said, God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Yeah. Okay. I Steve. got a mic over here. Oh, okay. Yep. Sorry. Nope. Uh, would you be able to describe the different... Sorry, over here, Steve. Where are you? Over there? Over, over here, here, stand over, over here. here. Okay. Stand, oh, okay, you're in the dark. <laughs> the, you're uh, in the dark, okay, gotcha. 
the differences of perspectives on the rapture, because that is something that the American church is very concerned with, especially Mm -hmm. uh, in Sunday schools, folks are brought up believing in something called the rapture. So can you explain that? Well, the rapture refers to catching up living Christians into heaven when Jesus comes back. And it's associated with the resurrection of the dead because Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now the word rapture isn't found there uh, in the English version, but the Latin version has the root word there from which we get our word rapture. And uh, so the rapture happens at the same time as the resurrection of the dead. All Christians throughout history have essentially believed in the rapture. That is, they believe that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead and a catching up of the living. Uh, Those are two parts of the same event. Uh, Paul says that's going to happen when Jesus comes back. Jesus said several times it's going to happen on the last day. He said, I'm going to raise them up on the last day. He said it four times in John chapter 6. The rapture is everywhere placed at the same time as the resurrection and at the same time as the second coming of Christ. The idea that the rapture would come seven years earlier, or now some people think three and a half years earlier than the second coming of Christ, uh, was not really uh, considered as a a valid option in the church throughout most of history. It became very popular in uh, in the 1830s with John Nelson Darby, and and, and he's the founder of dispensationalism. Now, most churches in America are sympathetic toward or or totally immersed in dispensationalism, and therefore the pre-trib rapture or maybe the mid-trib rapture, and there's even what they call a pre-wrath rapture, which is like three-quarters of the way through tribulation. All those are very popular views, but uh, you can't, I mean, I taught them. I taught the pre-trib rapture many years, but uh, my problem was I, eventually I found out there's nothing in the Bible that mentions one, and there are things that seem like they might rule it out, like the last day would seemingly be the day after which are no other days, and uh, if words mean anything, and if Jesus is going to raise his people upon the last day, that would not be seven years before the last day or, or three and a half years before. So I, uh, my own view, obviously, is that the rapture will occur with the resurrection uh, on the last day, and I know of nothing in Scripture that would uh, contradict that. Okay, we're going to have one more, and then I'm going to have closing reminders, and we're going to pray together and pray for Steve, okay? All right, one more. Yes, Steve, I had a question, you know, regarding uh, the preacher's view and the partial preachers, right? Preachers believe everything has already happened. Yeah. Partial preachers that still Christ is coming, right? Yeah. Okay, then what happened to Satan in where he's bound in Revelations? Is he still bound, and are, are we dealing with Satan now, or is that, you know, he's um, still incarcerated? Okay. You make the distinction between the full preterist and the, and the partial preterist, which is a good distinction to make. Uh, I talked about the preterist view of Revelation without making that distinction because you could believe that all of Revelation was fulfilled in 70 AD, but still believe there's other parts of the Bible that speak of the future second coming of Christ. So our belief in the second coming of Christ in the future does not depend on any view of Revelation because even before Revelation was in the canon, the church clearly taught that there's a second coming of Christ. You find it in Corinthians, you find it in Thessalonians, you find it in Jesus preaching, you find the angels saying it at the ascension. Uh, there's all kinds of references to the end of the world, second coming of Christ. And even if that's, even if the book of Revelation doesn't mention it, that doesn't mean that, the, that it denies that it will happen. It may be that Revelation is talking about something else. But a full preterist is a view that I consider to be wrong. In fact, I wrote a whole book against full preterism after I debated the main full preterist in the country um, called Why Not Full Preterism. Full preterism believe that all scripture is fulfilled in the past in AD 70. Now, partial preterist believes that some scriptures were, including most of Revelation, most of the Olivet Discourse. Some might even say all of Revelation, all of the Olivet Discourse. But a partial preterist simply means part of the bulk of prophecy in scripture has a past fulfillment, not all of it. And therefore, a partial preterist believes there's still a future second coming of Christ and all that. The full preterist is somewhat more, in my mind, heretical. They believe there's no future second coming of Christ. All that happened spiritually in 70 AD. And uh, I believe they give partial preterists a bad name because uh, partial preterists are completely orthodox on the point of the resurrection of the last day and Jesus coming back and so forth. Now, as far as Satan being bound, the full preterists believe not only that he's bound, 
full predators believe he's already in the, in the lake of fire. They believe Satan's not around anymore. I think they must feel that our sins are just from our sinful nature or something like that because they don't believe the devil's around anymore. Now, partial predators would still believe the devil's around. Hmm. Yeah. And, and now, as we close, I just want to let you know, because it hasn't been mentioned, I have a website, thenarrowpath.com. The name of my radio show that's on every day is called The Narrow Path. And at thenarrowpath.com, there's over 1,500 of my lectures, including my verse-by-verse -verse teaching through every book of the Bible, including Revelation. And I do take a, I do take a side in my teaching. I don't in my book. But uh, I teach verse-by-verse -verse through every book in the Bible. Those lectures are free to listen to on MP3 at the website. Uh, I also have hundreds and hundreds of lectures on various biblical topics. Eschatology and Revelation are not my specialty. Obviously, I know something about it, but I, it's, I, it's not a specialty of mine. It's the whole Bible is my oyster. And uh, all those lectures you can hear for free at the website, thenarrowpath.com. And uh, so I'd encourage you to use them. Yeah, I would encourage you to do that. In fact, uh, Steve doesn't know this, but one season of my life for my uh, morning studies, I went through his verse-by-verse that the teaching he's done in Revelation, and it's quite good. And so I encourage you to check out his website. Uh, also, just if you look him up on YouTube, he's done uh, several debates with other great uh, evangelical scholars and theologians. Um, let me tell you one of the things I love about this person. Um, there are lots of issues in the Christian world that are worthy of robust um, discussion that are open-handed issues and we weigh the evidence on and we look at what the scripture says. And I'm telling you, uh, this guy has many friends that are close friends that, that, you know, they have these robust discussions and it's good to wrestle over these things. Uh, and I'm hoping, honestly, that this allows you to wrestle and I pray you get his book because it will allow you to go through it. Here's what I love about his book. I went through this whole thing and by the time I got done, I had no idea what view you held. It was intentional. It was intentional on his part. But what he does is he doesn't coerce you or indoctrinate you. He explains, here's the evidence. Here's what many theologians have thought. Weigh the evidence and come to a conclusion based on the best evidence of what you think, knowing that Christ will be glorified. And here's the great thing about Revelation. At the end of the day, it says, God wins the day. And we have the victory. And, uh, and so I'm just so excited about that. And uh, that's what we live for. And we live for the day of his coming, don't we? That's what we look forward to. So, uh, brother, we love you. And we thank, thank you, you that you're here. Yeah. Can we pray for him before we're done? Father, we thank you for this uh, servant of the Lord. And we thank you for your hand that it's clearly on him. Father, uh, Lord, you've blessed him, and he has had and will ha continue to have a fruitful ministry. And we just pray you'd continue to use him, that you would bless him, encourage him, strengthen him, empower him by your Holy Spirit. Oh, we ask you, God, and I pray, Lord, that his days would be filled with joy. Would you just give him much joy in the Lord as he serves you? Bless his family, his wife. And uh, God, we love you, and we thank you for your good work. Lord, we surrender to you. We submit to you. If there's anyone here, as I pray, that doesn't know Jesus Christ, you can today. And if you'd like to talk to me, uh, just come and talk to me. Uh, I'll be right up here by the stage for a little bit because you don't have to leave not knowing Jesus, um, the greatest thing in your life. Father, we love you. We glorify you, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. Amen.